six, seven percent at the moment, you get some idea of just how low interest rates are and how much of an issue it may be for the banks going forward. And we'll know in short order uh, how they're looking, because by this time next week, we'll start to see second quarter results from the biggest lenders. So at that point, you really kind of will be able to uh, assess just how much of an issue lower rates and a weaker economy are for the banks here. It sort of bears repeating every single day now that the big five tech companies account for more than 22% of the S&P 500. So no matter what you see in terms of direction, it's really, you know, absolutely uh, on those companies for that, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, if you really kind of want to ramp things up, you look at the NASDAQ 100 index, those five companies, 46% of that measure, more than twice as much weight in that particular indicator, which, by the way, in the last few days has uh, surpassed its 2000 record relative to the S&P 500. So the ratio between those two indexes at a record really reflecting uh, the performance of uh, you know, Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Alphabet, you know, the owner of Google and also Facebook. Those are your top five. And they are certainly dominating the market landscape, you know, no matter how you choose to measure it at this point, basically. Are we waiting for China to do something else again? I mean, if China came out and sort of gave another little goose to its equity market, would we suddenly see a different story in the United States, Dave? You know, China, it seems to me over the years, has kind of been its own animal to some extent. And you wonder now, you know, with the government trying to push prices higher, working with state-run media, that sort of thing, uh, whether there's much of a carryover beyond the mainland. And you know, especially when you consider the issues when it comes to Hong Kong and, you know, how the tech companies are starting to pull back from sort of helping the authorities there. Uh, you know, it, it's clear to some extent that China is kind of a market unto itself. I mean, it's one that gets watched pretty closely in the context of emerging markets because it has the kind of dominance there that those five tech companies we were just talking about do within the U.S. at the same time. You know, does it really kind of carry over to developed markets? That, that becomes a bigger issue. Bloomberg Stocks Editor Dave Wilson, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Uh, looking at the markets here, you know, as Dave was suggesting here, you know, a little bit of a pullback, but boy, we had a strong tape yesterday, Vani. I was just, you know, throughout the day, you saw uh, buyer demand out there. It wasn't just kind of at the opening and then we kind of hang there. There was good volume throughout the day, good buying throughout the day. Uh, and today, just kind of pulling back a little bit. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I was reading as well Jim Vogel on, you know, bonds and treasuries, and he also talks about households sustaining any rally that the Fed may launch. So perhaps it is a question of households getting involved. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, we've certainly seen in certain names, and some folks were suggesting with Tesla in particular, seeing a lot of retail buying getting back into that name. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. Let's get World of National Headlines with Nathan Hager. Nathan. Paul, later this morning, Vice President Mike Pence will lead a video conference with governors on the response to the coronavirus pandemic. As the number of infections in this country continues to rise, the U.S. is edging close to 3 million cases. Atlanta may New order place to sell short euro at 112.91. For not just in Georgia, but we're paying for it across the country, and people are paying for it with their lives. Bottoms was on ABC's Good Morning America. The mayor announced yesterday she's tested positive for COVID-19 after showing no symptoms. Police in Atlanta have cleared the protest encampment at that Wendy's where a white police officer shot and killed Rayshard Brooks last month. Demonstrators had demanded police reform and a memorial to Brooks before they would leave. But for Atlanta City Council member Joyce Shepard. As a result of what happened this weekend, all bets are off. A young girl was killed out here. Eight-year-old Sicoria Turner was killed in her car as she and her mother tried to drive through the protest site. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp has authorized up to 1,000 National Guard troops to keep the peace in the area. Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg says her company needs to get better at removing hateful speech. 
The chief operating officer and Facebook CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, are due to meet today in Washington with the NAACP and the Anti-Defamation League. They've organized an ad boycott this month over Facebook's content policies. In a post today, Sandberg said Facebook will release its long-awaited civil rights audit tomorrow. She says it's had a profound impact on the company's culture. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. People love a good story. They like it even better when that story is real. Is this something strange in the numbers? Paul Sweeney. That seems like a big miss to me. Bonnie Quinn. New funds getting started in order to take advantage of what might be a moment. Bloomberg Markets. Weekday mornings at 10 Eastern. If Russia does throw this spanner in the works, what... New short position open for Euro USD for Euro at 112.91. So, new short position at 112.91. Contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. The best of Bloomberg Business Week every business day. We've got a market sell-off that's spreading around the globe. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Mazur and Jason Kelly. Let's do the Bloomberg Business Week bite of the day, Carol. The day's breaking global business, finance, and tech news along with smart analysis. We know the Fed is going to be sure and steady. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast. A great, great scoop on the terminal. Listen today on BloombergRadio.com, the Bloomberg Business app, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo Jelly Jelly adjective Jelly is a shorter, better way to say jealous As in, Chloe, I am like so jelly of your unicorn phone case You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same Visit AdoptUSKids.org Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Adopt U.S. Kids and the Ad Council COVID-19, on days when it's... The big Volkswagen event is now on. If you're after an approved used Volkswagen, for a limited time, you can buy one with two years warranty, two years MOT cover, two years roadside assistance, and two services all included at 8.9% APR representative. Hello, sir. Do any take your fancy? Uh, I need to sit down. The big Volkswagen event. With every type of car on offer, you may have trouble choosing. With Solutions Personal Contract Plan until 12th of July at participating retailers on used Volkswagens aged between 90 days and 60 months only. Indemnities may be required. Warranty valid for vehicles up to 100,000 miles at activation. MOT cover is up to two years and is underwritten by UK General Insurance Limited. Volkswagen Finance. Contact your local retailer. Hey, I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Curry's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. Just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town. So come in and see if that fridge can hold enough for your hungry household. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC World. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. At Halfords, we're here to get you where you want to be. Why not book an MOT to get you safely back on the road? With over 600,000 carried out every year at 350 garages, you can always count on our experts. And get back to visiting those you've missed the most. Hi, Mum. From a safe distance, of course. From MOTs to battery replacements and tyre fittings, there's no job too big or too small. Halfords, for life's journeys. Euroton le Chateau is a safer way to get to France and beyond. 
with social distancing built in. There's no scrum at security, hanging around for your bags or shouldering strangers in your seat. With Eurotunnel Le Shuttle, simply drive on at Folkestone and stay in your car comfortably. Then drive off 35 minutes later. Stay safe. Go Tunnel, Eurotunnel Le Shuttle, a safer way to France and beyond. Short on time? Don't worry, you can still get your cook on with Asda. Get three Asda ready meals for just £5.50. Like our beef lasagna or our tomato and mozzarella panette bake. Hang up your oven gloves, we've got dinner covered. Asda. Save money, live better. Selected stores and lines, subject to availability. Meals 400 grams, £2.10 each. Give yourself a Diet Coke break. Whether you're dreaming of a house the size of a football stadium or a football stadium in the back garden of your house, what you need is dream come true money. The Euro Millions jackpot keeps getting bigger. With a massive £127 million stirred for grabs in tonight's draw. That's dream come true money. Euro Millions from the National Lottery. Play online or on the app. Estimated jackpot rules and procedures apply. Players must be 16 or over. How do we control coronavirus now? Here's Michael, a delivery driver. All day, every day, I'm seeing people. Last thing I want to do is give anyone coronavirus. So the first sign of a cough, soon as my temperature rises, any loss of taste or smell, I'm staying in, booking a test, only going out to get it done. I mean, you want to know straight away, right? That's how we protect each other. To get a test, go to nhs.uk slash coronavirus or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Stocks are off earlier lows, but still down as U.S. job openings unexpectedly increased in May as state economy stirred to life and businesses look to hire new people. Let's check the markets as we do every 15 minutes. Right now, the S&P is little changed. Dow Jones Industrial Average is down one half of 1%, down 120 And the Nasdaq is up one half of 1%, up 48. The 10-year is a little changed with a yield of 0.67%. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is now up three-tenths of a percent at 40.76 a barrel, with Comex Gold up three-quarters of 1% at 1807.30 an ounce. The dollar yen, 107.57. The euro is $1.1290, and the British pound, $1.2570. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney and Bonnie Quinn on Bloomberg Radio. You know, April 15th is etched in our minds as tax day when we write the checks and uh, pay our money to Uncle Sam. This year, because of the pandemic, got a little bit of a break here. Tax day is now July 15th. Uh, That's good news for taxpayers. What does it mean for the U.S. Treasury in terms of cash flow, I always wondered that, but now I've got somebody I can actually ask, and I think they might <laughs> have the answer. Ira Jersey, Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. So, Ira, so the U.S. government went three months without my tax check, which was quite substantial, more than much more than I wanted to write. So, what does it mean for the cash flow of the United States government? Yeah. So, you know, so two things. I'm placing an order to sell for 112.83 all three positions. So all three positions order placed to sell up. Order positions closed for euro USD. Let's see how much profit we'll get. Three times the previous record. Normally, the, Fed, the Treasury Department holds three to five hundred billion dollars of cash to use on a on a regular basis. But they've, you know, in, in anticipation of needing to spend more in the coming months, they've increased that quite a lot. So, so we'll get a hundred to two hundred billion dollars more in cash, I think, uh, next week um, over the uh, between this week and, and next week. For the market, that has a, an interesting uh, aspect to it because the way that the tre- Treasury Department's been increasing that cash balance is by issuing a lot of treasury bills. These are very short-term treasury um, instruments where where they they issued this debt over and over again. Because of the the tax day being moved, I think over the next week or two, um, they're going to start. To, you're going to start to see less T bills being issued, and actually maybe a pay down of some of the T bills that are are in the market at this moment. And 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 that means that there'll be a little bit less supply than there has been over. Over recent months. 
So also the White House is now looking at another stimulus package, wants Congress to pass it by the first week in August, this according to Vice President Pence's top aide, wants to keep the cost at a trillion dollars or less. Whatever about, you know, the amount, it's it's a lot, right? And it will need to be raised at some point, Ira, in, in debt markets, right? So what happens there? Does it have an impact on yields, on the fixed income market, on, you know, mandates? Yeah, so the impact on yields of supply of Treasury supply is very, very spurious. In fact, if you go back historically and you look what's tended to happen when you've had additional supply, it's basically you don't see yields rise for a few years until the economy recovers, right? So the, the, uh, the pace of the economy matters a lot more. Now, now, I think what the additional supply of another stimulus could mean is that when we do finally kind of get lift off of the economy, that you could see another taper tantrum type moment that at some point the Fed steps away a little bit, there's a lot of treasuries outstanding, and you wind up seeing a very significant and, and dramatic move it up, upward in yields, you know, maybe 50, 100, 150 basis points uh, in a very short period of time. Um, and, and that is actually something that's kind of in our, in our you know, I want to say worry case scenario, because when that happens is very difficult to judge at this point. We're probably still a year away from that that at least. Um, but it does mean that you could get larger and larger moves in the Treasury market um, that will can be pretty disruptive, quite frankly, to things like the mortgage market and, and to, uh, to, to basically economic activity, because large moves like that do change the thinking of people who are thinking about borrowing in order to, uh, you know, get new plant and equipment or buy a new house. You know, all of these things get... Uh, um, um, get permeated through uh, the market when you have large moves in, in Treasury yields. So, Ira, we, you know, the Fed, I think, has generally gotten uh, very good uh, marks from the market in terms of how they've reacted to the economic uh, fallout from the pandemic here. You know, as it relates to their bond buying program, what's, what's the actual evidence telling us? Have they, how active have they actually been in this market? Yeah, well, they've they've been very transparent about what they're buying when it comes to treasuries and mortgages. Um, you know, they quite frankly, it was very similar to what happened during QE3. It's become very rote at this point, where um, we know what sectors they're buying, we know when they're buying them, so the the market sets up for that, and um, you know, they'll they'll buy their four and a half billion dollars a day worth of worth of treasuries, which is which is reasonably significant. You know, it's not it. it Given the amount of issuance, they're still that they're not buying more than the uh, Treasury Department's issuing every month, but they are buying a substantial amount of the uh, market risk that's out there, and and that is having a uh, uh, an impact on volatility. So you've seen where ten-year nominal Treasury yields have basically been between uh, between 60 and 80 basis points, uh, basically for the last three months, and they're likely to stay there for a while, particularly while the Fed is doing all of these uh, bond purchases. And on top of that, committing to keeping interest rates low at the front end for the next couple of years. Briefly, Ira, I already mentioned this, but Jim Vogel this morning talking about the Fed launching a bond rally, but households sustaining it and that we shouldn't forget that, that this is the power of households in the debt market. Do you agree? So, yeah, I mean, households have been, been purchasers of, uh, of fixed income assets, generally speaking. Um, yeah, you know, they, there was a little bit of a rotation uh, that occurred. I, I think that, um, that uh, that's true, but the risk is, is that that's where the taper tantrum comes in, because eventually when bond yields rise, those people can, don't under, necessarily understand the amount of risk they're taking, especially when bond yields are yielding you know, 70 basis points for the 10-year. Um, that doesn't leave a, a big margin for error if uh, if bond yields go up just a little bit you can start losing money all right so ira always fantastic to speak with you and even if yields aren't moving around or if, if bond prices aren't moving around too much ira always has a lot to tell us about uh, underneath the hood in the bond market yes. <laughs> <laughs> ira jersey chief u.s interest rate strategist bloomberg intelligence i'm telling you paul it's where it all happens it is it's the that's the, the market and uh, ira you know he knows this this is better than anybody so we always love chatting with him exactly the 10 year yield right now, 67 basis points. You're listening to Bloomberg Radio. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. 
Investors are catching their breath after a ferocious start to the week, even as the pace of new COVID-19 cases globally raises concerns about another virus wave. The Dow dropping more than 140 points. One of the front runners in the race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine will receive $1.6 billion from the government to develop its experimental shot. The funds will allow Novavax to deliver 100 million doses as soon as late 2020. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg will meet today with leaders of the NAACP and other civil rights organizations to talk about how the tech giant could do more to fight injustice. Advocates have led a campaign to keep advertisers from spending on Facebook. And the Disney Plus app was downloaded more than 266,000 times last weekend in the U.S. as it premiered the movie version of Hamilton. That's 72% more than the June average for downloads, according to tracking service Aptopia. Courtney Donahoe, Bloomberg Radio. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me. But I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. How long? How much? How many? Financial policy and medical experts are working on answers 24-7. What about public debt? We are listening to those experts 24-7. Is the Fed effectively widening this wealth gap with its programs? Because you want answers, too. What's the most important? The trillions in stimulus, the economy's reopening, or the infections curve bending? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg Radio. Dot com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Are you interested in a challenging and exciting... Hey, I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Curry's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. Yay! Just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town. So come in and see if that 55-inch TV is perfect for the return of sport. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC world. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. Honda. We're not a car company. We're more of a listening company. And now our ears have brought our attention to where people feel most comfortable. The lounge. So we asked ourselves, what could Honda do to innovate in this space? Well, how about more space? Calm and uncluttered with modern yet retro styling and built-in screens compatible with your games console. It's the most comfortable lounge you've ever driven. Introducing the new Honda E, our small electric city car. Honda. The power of dreams. How do we control coronavirus now? Here's Michael, a delivery driver. All day, every day, I'm seeing people. Last thing I want to do is give anyone coronavirus. So the first sign of a cough, soon as my temperature rises, any loss of taste or smell, I'm staying in, booking a test, only going out to get it done. I mean, you want to know straight away, right? That's how we protect each other. To get a test, go to nhs.uk slash coronavirus or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Word of hockey and pop culture coexist. So let me get this straight. 
you would be able to name more people nostalgically than currently? This doesn't Come on. You're crazy. crazy. I know, I know. <laughs> Other podcasts, Buck Zoop, <laughs> NHL analyst Greg Wyshynski, Sean McAdoo, and Ryan Lambert chase the conversational biscuit up and down the ice, skating between serious discussion on what's happening in pro hockey to irreverent opinions on movies, fast food, and life in general. Search Buck Soup on TuneIn to listen. Looking for your daily fix of NFL news and analysis? In that. So we had to blow it up at the Super Bowl predictions instead. Look no further than the Pick 6 Podcast, where CBS sports writer Will Brinson gets you up to speed with what's trending in the NFL that day so that you're always in the know. Yeah, it's pretty revealing of Brinson's methodology for predictions. When he gets mad at people for predicting good teams are going to win the Super Bowl or good players are going to win major awards, that's how you wind up. Search Pick 6 on TuneIn to listen. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York, Bloomberg 1130, to Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991, to Boston, Bloomberg 1061, to San Francisco, Bloomberg 960, to the country, Sirius XM Channel 119, and around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Markets. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. That was a $669 billion business loan program. We're going to take a look at where the money went. Plus, we're going to chat with Chris Aylman, Chief Investment Officer of Calsters, on why it's time to rebalance your 401k. But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. We're going down from down to mixed fall as uh, gains in tech shares are blunting the weakness in airlines and hotels. This all coming with signs the world economy has a long way to go to get back on track. Uh, we check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day here on Bloomberg Radio. S&P 500 is now down uh, less than a tenth of a percent, down two. The Dow's down six tenths of a percent, down 150. And the Nasdaq's up a half a percent, up 47. The 10-year is little changed with a yield of 0.67 percent. West Texas Intermediate crude's in the green, up three tenths of a percent at 40.77 a barrel. Comex Gold's up eight tenths of a percent at 18.0810 per ounce. The dollar yen 107.58. The euro's a dollar 12.82, and the British pound the dollar 25.78. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney and Bonnie Quinn on Bloomberg Radio. So we got the PPP data yesterday, and loan recipients included a law firm run by one of President Trump's key defenders in the Russia probe, that's Mark Kasowitz. We also had a Kushner family real estate project in there, the publisher of the National Enquirer, American Media, of course. And uh, lots, lots more interesting data to mine. 88,000 loans went to religious organizations. Let's bring in two people who've mined the database now and know a lot about what they're talking about. Tim O'Brien is Bloomberg Opinion columnist, and Mark Niquette joins us as well. Tim, let's begin with you, because there were a lot of headlines about how Trump uh, affiliated companies or those affiliated with at least, you know, Trump's trademarks got loans. Was there anything necessarily shady or uh, unusual about this? Well, I think the, the broader thing to think about to begin with is, is was this program properly conceived from the beginning? <clears throat> and, and has there been enough oversight to make sure that the most needy businesses got the money they needed to stay afloat. And we don't have enough evidence yet to know whether that broader goal has been reached. And the problem with all of these stories about insiders getting first in line to get the loans raises you know, one facet of uh, one set of problems around this, which is um, there weren't clear guidelines about who was the most deserving. And whether those are businesses affiliated um, with Democrats or Republicans, I think there's a real problem with anybody from any party getting, getting to the front of the line first because they have connections in Washington or connections to the S SBA or connections to the White House. And certainly um, there was concerns about this with Trump from the very beginning. Uh, Chuck Schumer early on when the, peop when, when the CARES Act was being drafted said there would be language in there to make sure that uh, Trump-related entities didn't get any funding. And, and then it ended up being that the PPP funding, which is one of the biggest arms of the bailout, was exempt from some of that. And, and you have to wonder why that occurred. Mm. So, Mark, you wrote uh, just a fantastic article kind of detailing what happened here, what's going on, where the money's going. What are some of the key takeaways you had? Like, who were some of the, the big recipients that maybe surprised you that uh, received uh, money? 
Well, it was, it was quite a range of, of companies that did access the funding, um, including, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a, a lot of nonprofits and religious organizations. Um, you know, we saw, as you said, about 88,000 loans for religious organizations, including the uh, Archdiocese of New York, um, and nonprofits ranging from universities to museums to zoos that tap this funding. And what was striking about it is just you know, the, the breadth of these companies, um, both nonprofit and, and, and corporations that tapped this loan, it sort of gave you a sense of just how, you know, deep the impact was or uh, how uh, frantic these companies were to apply for this aid, uh, particularly when this project launched. Yeah, I mean, Tim, there was money left over and there was a lot of problems in actually trying to apply for money. And, you know, the idea that money being left over, uh, you know, is, is just wasteful, right? And there's another problem here as well. We don't know who accessed the largest loans. Now, we don't know who accessed the smallest ones either, but there was certainly a sort of an effort to have small businesses only apply for what they needed. So it does seem like there may have been, you know, different levels of invitation to this particular program. Well, you know, there were two tranches, remember, the first tranche, there were, there were a lot of problems with the SBA's computer systems, banks being gatekeepers to small businesses to get the money, uh, you know, the, the, the first huge tranche of this over $300 billion uh, went out the door in two weeks. Um, I think there was a strong effort made when the second round of funding came along to make sure <clears throat> that most, most authentically small businesses that didn't have resources, meaning uh, you know, companies that weren't publicly traded, for example, um, uh, had had better channels in to get the money, and it appears that they did. And I think that the fact that there was some money left over, um, I think, suggests that at least some of the initial bleeding was staunched. But um, we're still in early days in this, and, and I think the government's going to have to kind of wrestle with the reality that this may have just been a stopgap measure. Um, and also with the reality that there just simply hasn't been enough oversight and data collection put in place for the public to really know whether or not these programs have met their goals. Mark, what's the sense of the oversight here? Is there a belief here? I know we're kind of early days, but is there a consensus or a belief that the oversight was adequate or not so much? No, I think there's, there's, there's growing pushback that not enough disclosure happened here. I mean, one of the things that, that occurred was the Trump administration uh, initially said it wasn't going to disclose any data about the uh, PPP loans, arguing that this was proprietary or confidential information um, because, you know, payroll information was used to calculate the amount of the loans. And the idea was, you know, particularly smaller firms, you know, releasing that payroll data would be, you know, proprietary or confidential. And after pushback from uh, the public and lawmakers, uh, SBA and Treasury agreed to release sort of some of the data. We got the names of companies and uh, other details uh, for all loans of more than 150000 But for loans under 150000 all you got was a loan amount and the um, um, some demographic information. Um, and as it turns out, the, that, that accounts for about 86, 87 percent of all of the loans fall into that category of less than 100. Fifty thousand. So we don't we don't have you know details of who got these loans uh, for the majority of the borrowers, and you're you're seeing push by uh, Democrats in particular to say, well, you know, the disclosure is fine. Uh, we see you know the names of companies for the larger loans, but we need yep. to really see who took these lower loans, just because that's the only way we're going to be be able to evaluate right. whether this program actually reached the borrowers it needed to. Mark Nickett, thanks so much for joining us. Mark is a corporate influence reporter for uh, Bloomberg News and, of course, Tim O'Brien, senior opinion columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. On this paytech, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, $669 billion uh, and uh, lots of questions about where that money went. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. for World and National Headlines with Nathan Haber. Nathan. Paul, Florida just reported another 3.6% increase in coronavirus cases. It's the third straight day the state's been at or below the previous seven-day average. New York just added three more states to its quarantine list. Those are just the latest developments in a U.S. outbreak that is now close to the 3 million infection mark. Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff, Mark Short, tells Bloomberg Radio another nationwide shutdown is off the table. When the United
United States asked uh, Americans to uh, sacrifice for 45 days to slow the spread. Uh, people made enormous sacrifices. It gave us the time and preparation to build supplies from across the globe to make sure that our hospitals were better prepared and to develop better therapeutics. Short also says the White House wants Congress to pass another round of stimulus capped at a trillion dollars before it leaves for summer recess early next month. Congress is in recess right now, but members of House Appropriations Subcommittees are on Capitol Hill to approve spending bills for the next year. Bloomberg's Irv Chapman reports from Washington. Members of both parties on the Homeland Security Subcommittee agreed on most of the spending for agencies from emergency management to Coast Guard. Then Chairwoman Lucille Roybal Allard said there would be no money for a wall on the Mexican border. Provision is included prohibiting the use of any federal funds for border barriers construction. Ranking Republican Chuck Fleischman. This wall is necessary and it is an effective asset against transnational criminal organizations trafficking and smuggling enterprises. The bill passed and the subcommittee's work was done. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Elite advisory firms rely on BNY Mellon's Pershing to meet the needs of their most complex clients. Karen Novak, Chief Operating Officer at Pershing Advisor Solutions, explains how. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, we bring customized insights and strategies to help you grow your advisory business and stay on the leading edge. We can support the needs of your most sophisticated clients with a full range of investment and wealth management solutions, from access to private banking to consolidated bank and brokerage custody. Learn why so many of the largest advisory firms turn to us for the financial strength and high-touch service that BNY Mellon's Pershing can provide. Are you well-positioned to stand out from your competition? Learn more at Pershing.com or call 800-445-4467. Brokerage custody provided by Pershing LLC and other services provided by Pershing Advisor Solutions LLC. Both members of FINRA and SIPC. Private banking and bank custody provided by BNY Mellon NA. Member FDIC. Okay, we just got confirmation from broker. Total profit on uh, all euro positions, 840 pounds. Everything, all explanation you can see on the screen. Help you organize your philanthropy with our donor advised fund. A fund can be established with a minimum tax deductible contribution of $5,000. Make grants to your favorite charities, and JCF handles all the administration and reporting. At the year end, our board awards community grants from fees and endowment income to UJ's annual campaign. We also make gifts to specific organizations the elderly, Holocaust survivors, the hungry. The fact that we come together as a community at the end of the year to build community that's what makes us different get better at giving back to find out more about jcf's impact visit jcfny.org and download the giving report jcf we have a gift for giving with covid 19 so much is unknown decisions decisions clearing isn't it great so much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. Listening has always taught us a lot at Honda. And lately, we've been listening to your thumbs. Because thumbs can do everything now. The world is at their thumb tips. So now, the My Honda Plus app lets the thumb take control of your car too. Even when you're not inside the new Honda E, your thumb can find where you parked, set the temperature before you get in, check how much the battery is charged, and schedule charging for when electricity is cheapest. The new Honda E and My Honda Plus app. Oh, a thumbs up. Honda, the power of dreams. Give yourself a Diet Coke break. How do we control coronavirus now? Listen to Claudia. She's a care worker. 
I got the call from NHS Test and Trace, told I'd been in contact with someone with coronavirus. Couldn't believe it. I had to isolate at home for 14 days. Couldn't go to work, couldn't go to the shops, couldn't get out to exercise. I didn't even feel ill. But you know what? To protect my family, my friends, my community, well, you just do it, don't you? Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. This is the home that stays in together. So Flora's thing's clean. In this windy weather. That disinfects doorknobs, floors, baked bean cans. Fills rooms with fragrance. Does meetings in gym jams. This is a home that cares with pride. Shares smiles and waves with those either side. Because this is your London, not inside alone. But all house proud together. One big beautiful home. So Flora, killing germs beautifully since 1922. Minions, did you know Sky Broadband Superfast guarantees your speed? No, Stuart, it doesn't guarantee you'll win the game. Or that your video will go viral. Or that you'll match with the love of your life. But Sky Broadband Superfast does guarantee the speed we promised or money back. So reliable, it's minion proof. Sky, believe in better. Sky Fiber Aries only, speed measured to hub, must drop below min download speed for three consecutive days. One month subscription refund, claim up to twice in midterm after first fortnight to see sky.com. We're all guilty of spending too much time on social media. Why not add something genuinely useful to your feed with TuneIn? Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn about some of the best stuff happening around the app. You might just discover your next audio obsession. This is Mike Golick from ESPN's Golick and Wingo. Every morning, Trey Wingo, my son, and I sit down to discuss all the news, drama, and highlights spinning the sports world that day. And with TuneIn, you can hear us whenever and wherever you go. Just search Golick and Wingo to start listening today. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, Keenan Thompson. He's the longest-running cast member ever on Saturday Night Live, and it took him years to feel like he belonged. It just never seemed real for so long. Like, I had such a hard time even associating myself being on the show for a long time. Like, I wouldn't watch, you know what I'm saying, just because really? I felt like I was ruining it. Keenan Thompson joins us next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour. Listen to this episode on TuneIn today. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. A bit of an anomaly. Most stocks on the S&P are down, though the index was down just a tad itself as heavyweights like Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook advanced, sending the Nasdaq toward a record high. Companies dependent on the end of the coronavirus lockdowns are underperforming. Let's look at those numbers as we do every 15 minutes here on Bloomberg. S&P 500 is uh, now down three-tenths of a percent, down nine. The Dow's down nine-tenths of a percent, down 229. And the Nasdaq is up three-tenths of a percent, up 30. Uh, the 10 years up 230 seconds with a yield of 0.66 percent. West Texas Intermediate Crude's reversed course. It's now little changed, but down uh, at 40.60 per barrel. Comex Gold's up three-quarters of a percent at 1806.80 an ounce. The dollar yen, 107.63. The euro, dollar 1274. And the British pound, the dollar twenty-five fifty-four. U.S. job openings unexpectedly increased in May as state economies stirred to life and businesses looked to hire new people. The number of available positions rose to five point four million during the month from five million in April. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Yeah, I'm just looking at a one-year chart for the S&P 500, and then obviously, you know, back in March we saw that you know 34 percent, 35 percent decline in the S&P as a pandemic, and the economic impacts of the pandemic really became apparent to investors. But you know, we've retraced much of that decline here. We have the S&P at 3170 here, off a little bit today get a sense of kind of where we go from here. Chris Ailman, he's a chief investment officer for the California, California State Teachers uh, Retirement System. Um, Chris, what are you telling your participants in your plan about the market here, uh, given the tremendous volatility we've seen just over the past, you know, three to four months? Hey, good to talk to you, Paul. You know, and that's it. You back up and take the long-term view. Look at the market over the last year. What surprises most people is we're actually positive. You know, if we had thought last July that we'd have a global pandemic and that the economy would come to a complete stop, you wouldn't expect the market to be up 
uh, you know, 8% from where we were roughly. So uh, this is a time to really back away from the daily news. I know, you know, the PPP, uh, Paycheck Protection uh, Loans, will dominate the headlines. But in a couple of weeks, we're going to have April 15th again, all of a sudden in July. And it's a good time to back up and look at your investments, rebalance your asset allocation, and not get carried away with the volatility of this market. It has been crazy in the first six months. That said, Chris, all it's really done is gone up, I mean, after that massive plunge in March. So what, what what's to say that that's going to keep going? I mean, really, we're very dependent on those five companies that make up more than a fifth of the market, aren't we? Oh, Bonnie, you hit it on the head. Um, as everybody's been saying, this is a market of stocks. And when you look at the S&P 500, those five, six stocks are dominating uh, the vast majority of the other 495 stocks are still below where they started the year uh, or just barely trending above. Um, so uh, it's a tough year. You, you know that I'm a big fan of index funds. I mm-hmm. say own the market. Um, this is a time where normally when you have this kind of volatility, a, a drop and a, a rally where the active manager should make money. Uh, but the real economy bears no resemblance uh, to the stock market. It is off in its own world. So I have found the active managers are really getting hurt. You know, growth stocks, principally the large growth stocks, have been all the return. And value stocks are actually negative on the year. So fundamentals don't make any sense. I mean, just like Warren Buffett has said, uh, this market is, is baffling in here. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense. That said, I think investors are better off owning the entire market as a whole, so they get those growth stocks, but they also get some of those value stocks that are trying to tread water through the, the virus. Mm-hmm. So, Chris, you, you, you hit on a common theme that we've heard from many, that the market is not really reflective of the economy. What is your call here as we... As it relates to the economy here, you know, we've thrown V's, W's, L's, U's. Um, as it relates to the economy, we're seeing, you know, a lot of states seeing becoming hot spots that were in terms of the virus. How are you thinking about the econo- economy over the next several quarters? You know, you don't fight the Fed. So with that in mind and that they're trying to stimulate the economy, the the federal government on the fiscal side is – is running such a big deficit, I just don't think they can keep trying to stimulate. So I would say a sloppy W. Picture the way a doctor typically signs a prescription note and uh, (laughs) picture that W. It's going to be sloppy. I don't think it's going to go well in the economy. Now, how does the stock market react? That's a completely different question and tough to figure out. Um, It should start to bear some resemblance to reality. But Uh, This is not your normal market. You've got millions and millions of day traders sitting around watching Bloomberg, looking at their screens, uh, no sports to bet on, uh, very few uh, casinos to go to. So it's suddenly become a speculative market around the world. Um, I think it's really a time for an investor to to be weary, not try to be a day trader. And I think that we're going to have a tough go. I mean, there's just a huge percentage of the economy that is still shut down. Think of the airlines, the cruise ships, not just the restaurants, but all those people you were talking about, the zoos um, that got uh, the PPP loans. We still have huge unemployment, even though the uh, statistics don't show giant numbers. Uh, People are surviving on that $600 a week uh, federal stimulus, and that just can't go on forever. Chris, you're you know a big proponent of, of explaining that Calsters is like a tanker. When you try to, to move it, it takes some time. Are you already looking at the possibility that the president will not be the president post this election and that maybe it will be a Joe Biden presidency? And what would you do with portfolios in that instance? Well, Vani, I've learned not to try to predict politics. It's crazy. That's a whole other game. Mm-hmm. But I have to tell you, it's too early. I think, in my view, to try and position your portfolio in anticipation of that. What I am concerned about is a very sloppy election, a contested election, where we'll see uh, it drawn out in court. A lot of us forget the the Gore-Bush election many, many years ago. And while the market managed that through that crisis because it was only the state of Florida, I'm worried that all the key states could end up in lawsuits and that this could be a really contested election, which should be bad for the market, that level of uncertainty. 
whether one party or the other wins and takes control, the market will fet that out in, in January and in February. Um, I think it's still going to be a, it's going to be a problem for the market once we start hitting August and September. Then, then the election becomes very clear right in their face, and that uncertainty about who's in control will cause uh, volatility in the markets as they gyrate back and forth, particularly in industries like the drug makers, um, uh, what happens in terms of the federal bailouts. Uh, it does risk tax law and so many issues when we have an election. Chris, uh, real quick, maybe 30 seconds. Uh, how concerned are you about the deteriorating uh, relationship between the U.S. and China? Uh, Paul, that is absolutely something to watch. Our board in 2021 is going to do a deep dive into China and really understand it. It is one of the few economies growing at, you know, close to 8% on the, when it rebounds. But the ESG issues are enormous. And, and just the fact that it's a communist system, are we comfortable investing in that kind of a market? So that's our number one trading partner, uh, not number one in terms of size, but, I mean, it's the number two economy in the world. That relationship matters a ton. Chris, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. Chris Elman is CIO of Calsters, more than $235 billion in assets under management, and he's talking about a sloppy W-type recovery, which doesn't sound all that appetizing. It <laughs> doesn't say. sound very pleasant, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Rough seas ahead, according to Chris. Uh, once again, that is Chris Aylman of Calsters, the second biggest pension fund in the country, and of course, uh, teachers with a lot on their plates these days. Yes. You're listening to Bloomberg Radio. You need more than a soundbite. You need someone who... Hey, I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Curry's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. Yay! Just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town. So come in and see if that vacuum can take care of your well-trodden home. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC World. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. How do we control coronavirus now? Listen to Steph. She's a bus driver. Now that people are using public transport again, we really need to make sure that we keep each other safe. Passengers need to stay two metres apart. If that's not possible, make it at least one metre. I want to see everyone wearing face coverings over their mouth and nose, unless you've got a good reason not to. And when you get to where you're going, you need to wash your hands. We've still got to play our part. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. This is a message from the RNLI and Her Majesty's Coast Guard. Beach lifeguards can't be everywhere this summer, so they can't always protect your family, but you can. So keep an eye on your loved ones. Avoid taking risks in the sea. Don't use inflatables. In an emergency, dial 999 for the Coast Guard. Get more advice at rnli.org slash Beach 2020. Thank you. Want to get all your college sports news in one place? Turn on the Yahoo Sports College podcast to hear experts Dan Wetzel, Pat Forty, and Pete Thamel break down the latest NCAA stories from the football field to the basketball court and beyond. I think Reggie should, they should do a video of him running the Heritage Hall and front flipping in. <laughs> Remember that famous like front flip sure. in the end zone that he yeah. did? Uh, wasn't he the one who made that popular? I think, I think he, he might was. Have. I think he was, yeah. Search Yahoo College Sports Podcast on TuneIn to listen. Bloomberg.com on the Bloomberg Business app and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is Bloomberg Radio. 
This is Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney. The Fed action essentially unlimited quantitative easing. Companies taking aim at coronavirus vaccines and other treatments. This could be a lower for longer hit. Markets fell off glowing global once again. Breaking market news and inside from Bloomberg experts. It's possible that this is going to be a scarring recession. The Fed is really showing that they're doing whatever it takes. A lot of people don't expect that the economy will reopen in full. This is really hitting industrial and it's a major crisis. This is Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up, a very important discussion with Dr. Tom Frieden, former CDC director. We're going to get his thoughts on the surge in coronavirus in the U.S. Plus, we're going to take a look at the U.S. home market. Prices seem to be falling going forward. We're going to see what the future means for the U.S. housing market. But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. A little up and down. Stocks are trading mixed with gains in tech shares, uh, blunting the weakness in airlines and hotels. Mid signs the world's economy is not quite there, and it has a way to go to get there. Let's check the numbers as we do every 15 minutes. S&P 500 is now down less than a tenth of a percent, down two. The Dow's down seven tenths of a percent, down 176. And the Nasdaq's up one half of one percent, up 52. The 10 year is up 132nd with a yield of 0.67 percent. West Tech's intermediate crude is little changed at 4064 a barrel, while Comex Gold is up eight tenths of a percent at 1807.60 per ounce. The dollar yen 107.56. The euro is dollar 12.86, and the British pound the dollar 25.73. The housing market surprised economists by rallying in the midst of a pandemic, but the coronavirus may drag down home values after all. According to CoreLogic, prices will fall about 6.6% in the year through May of 2021. That's a Bloomberg business flash. Bloomberg Markets continues now. Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney. The small cap universe today seems to be reflecting what's going on in the large cap universe. Financial services down at 1.9% in the Russell 2000, the worst performing group. So let's bring in Dave Wilson to tell us what, what can we tell about what the small caps are doing today, Dave? Yeah, broadly speaking, though, Vani, uh, smaller companies down more than larger ones. The Russell 2000 index lower by about seven tenths of a percent. And the S&P 500 is only off one tenth of a percent. Biggest drop in the Russell belongs to Evolus, whose ticker is EOLS. The developer of a rival to the wrinkle treatment, Botox, has fallen about 31%. Evolus lost the first round of a U.S. trade dispute with Botox's maker, the Allergan unit of AbbVie. Uh, Consolidated Water, ticker is CWCO, has lost 12%. The company disclosed that its contract to build a water desalination plant in Mexico was terminated. Now, the Russell's biggest gain belongs to Vivint Solar, ticker VSLR. The rooftop solar company has jumped almost 33% after agreeing to a takeover by rival Sunrun. The all-stock deal is valued at about $1.5 billion. And Sunrun, ticker RUN, R-U-N, has the Russell's third biggest gain. It's up more than 21%. And COVID-19 vaccine developers are higher after Novavax received $1.6 billion from the U.S. government to work on its shot. Now, Novavax's ticker is NVAX. It's up about 28.5%. That's the second biggest gain to Russell. Then you see VBI vaccines, ticker VBIV, up 16%. And Vaxart, ticker VXRT, up 15%. Bloomberg Stocks Editor Dave Wilson, thank you so much for that update on the small and mid-cap universe. Well, I guess the discussion of this coronavirus really over the last uh, two to three weeks has been the surge in key states, including Southern California in particular, Texas, Florida, Arizona. And the question is, you know, how should we think about this virus? Is it waves? Is it just a a slow ember of coronavirus? issues and certain hot spots to get a good sense of kind of how this is playing out. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Tom Frieden. He's a former CDC director and currently president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. Uh, he joins us uh, right now. Dr. Frieden, Frieden, thank you so much for helping us. Uh, how should we think about how this virus is going to play out from now over to whenever we get to a vaccine? Fundamentally, the virus is not going to stop on its own. 
Anytime we don't do the right things, it can spread explosively. It may take a few weeks or a month or two for that explosion to happen, but it will happen if we're not careful. What happened in much of the southern part of the United States is that states opened, including restaurants and bars, while cases were still increasing. That's kind of like leaning into a left hook. You're going to get hit and hit hard. The U.S. is absolutely a global laggard here. Uh, other than a couple of other countries, there's no other place doing what we're doing. I've been in touch with public health colleagues from Australia. They've got a couple of hundred infections, and they're pulling out all the stops. They're doing everything possible to stop. They're blocking traffic between uh, states of Australia. In the U.S., we have more than 50,000 infections, and lots of people shrug. But the more we ignore it, the worse it will get. Dr. Frieden, now that we had left it sort of, you know, migrate on its own to different states and so on, is it too late to stop this thing in its tracks? I mean, if there was a federal mandate right now just for all business to cease for a few weeks, would that at least get rid of it out of the United States? It's definitely not too late to make a lot of progress. We are not going to eradicate this virus. It's going to be with us in all likelihood, not only for months, but for years. Now, a vaccine would make a huge difference, but we have to be sure never to take any shortcuts on safety. And a vaccine isn't going to be a quick fix. It's going to be complicated to get out and to deliver. But there is a lot we can do. Two broad arms of the response. Individuals can do the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands and wash your distance. And governments can do what we call the box it in approach. Test, isolate, contact trace, and quarantine. This is what governments all over the world have done. And by doing that, they've been able to cool the virus down. But in places like Phoenix and cities in Florida and Texas, where you're seeing explosive increasing increases, everyone's going to have to stay in or stay outside away from other people for a few weeks or potentially a month or two until it cools down so that those measures work. There's no one thing that's going to control this virus, not masks, not staying home, not testing, not banning travel. The only thing that's going to work is a coordinated, focused approach that uses a continuous learning, using data to improve our response. Dr. Tom Frieden, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your perspective there. Dr. Tom Frieden, he's a former CDC director, and he's currently president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. Um, and, Vania, I think the, the message is clear here. That, you know, I think there has to be a um, another kind of uh, response here. And the question is, does it need to be a federal response as opposed to just individual states? Yeah, and I think a lot of people are still calling for a bit of a federal response, even if it uh, seems like it possibly should have happened sooner. The president now is sort of looking at wearing masks a little bit more publicly, or at least talking about how he's not opposed to wearing masks, because unfortunately the mask issue became such a political issue. There's also a problem with antibody testing. A great story on the Bloomberg today. One of our Bloomberg Opinion columnists has taken five antibody tests, and she had two positive, two negative, and then finally the one from Quest Diagnostics was positive, and she decided that, yes, she does have some antibodies. But again, it's not clear how much freedom you have, even if you are positive for some antibodies. No, you're right. And I think the, um, the, the key issue, I guess, for a lot of folks right now is just, uh, you know, you take a look at what's happening in, in Texas, for example, just Houston, the hospitals there. Uh, they're experiencing exactly kind of what we experienced here in New York a couple of months ago in terms of the, you know, the overwhelming demand on the hospitals. And, um, you know, you just kind of you really ache for for those people in those markets because, you know, they sh arguably they should have learned from kind of what we had to experience here. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, they didn't in certain markets there. And now they're dealing uh, with. Uh, some of those key issues. So it's, it's, it's really painful to watch. In the meantime, we got fresh numbers as well, some uh, numbers out of New York and out of the UK as well. We're seeing hospitalizations increase as well. More hospitalizations today in New York. I mean, it does appear to have gone down to, you know, as few as possible. But uh, Italy, for example, had uh, 138 new coronavirus cases yep. today versus 208 Monday. So going in the right direction again in Italy, at least for hospitalizations.
Absolutely right. Right now, let's head down to our, our Washington, D.C. Bureau, Nathan Hagan, for World and National Headlines. Nathan. Paul, the White House is pushing for another round of coronavirus stimulus in the next few weeks. Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff, Mark Short, tells Bloomberg Radio Congress should get it done before lawmakers leave for their summer recess next month. The August recess for Congress should be the first week in August, and so yeah. by that timetable, so we want to have a bill on the president's desk. Short says the next round should be capped at a trillion dollars or less. He says there's been plenty of stimulus uh, filtered into the system. President Trump hosts his Mexican counterpart for a White House dinner tomorrow night to tout the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. Sources tell Bloomberg business executives from both countries are on the guest list. The event is the closest thing to a state dinner that can be organized during the pandemic. It will be held indoors. One source says there will be some social distancing. Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador says he has tested negative for coronavirus before arriving in Washington. He says he's willing to be tested again in the U.S. if he needs to. FBI Director Christopher Wray is accusing China of massive theft of U.S. data. In a speech at the Hudson Institute in Washington, Ray says the Chinese government is trying to compromise U.S. coronavirus research. He says China's leaders think they're in a generational fight to become the world's only superpower. An advisor to the head of Russia's space agency is under arrest on treason charges. According to state-run media, Ivan Safranov is accused of passing information on arms sales and other security matters to an unnamed NATO country. Safarov is a prominent former journalist, but the Kremlin says his arrest has nothing to do with his past journalistic work. Global News on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. You may not be getting on planes yet. At what point do we start to see this elusive V-shaped recovery? But for detailed, up-to-the-minute news of Asia, you don't have to. Do you think that the tension has the possibility to destabilize Asian assets? Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. Do you expect some of these companies that come and list here to then delist in New York? Tonight at 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. To protect his home and family from disaster, Steve used courage, wisdom, and his camera phone. That should do it. Way to go, Steve. By simply taking digital pictures of his family's important documents, Steve can always have them stored safely online. No matter when disaster strikes, learn other simple ways to protect your home and family before a natural disaster at ready.gov. That's ready.gov. A message from FEMA and the Ad Council. The market's in focus every business day. The Bloomberg Markets Podcast with Paul Sweeney and Bonnie Quinn. Are there some sectors that you want to have more or less exposure to? Markets fell off glowing global once again. Analysis of the day's Wall Street action. What's the thought on Apple here? From Bloomberg Intelligence, Bloomberg Opinion, and Influential Newsmakers. There's very, very disturbing dynamics at work. Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney and Bonnie Quinn. Subscribe today at BloombergRadio.com, the Bloomberg Business App, or iTunes. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. At age 30, Carissa finished her high school diploma. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, you can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. The doors are open. Prepare your child for the world ahead with Blundell School, Devon. An independent day and boarding school for 3 to 18-year-olds. Every day is a different adventure. Set in a hundred idyllic acres amid the rolling hills of Devon, Blundells can be a crucial part of the equation if you're considering a move to the southwest. We looked at schools right away across from Salisbury and Blundells punches well above its weight. Exeter down the road. We're proud to offer an outstanding, quality education. Less than two hours by direct train to central London. The happy teachers bring the lessons to life. Blundells, one of Devon and Cornwall's most prestigious schools for more than 400 years. Rated excellent by the ISI. Learn more at blundells.org. Hey, I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Corey's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. 
just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town, so come in and see if that 55-inch TV is perfect for the return of sport. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC world. Ever wondered how people's postcode lottery works? Easy. Your postcode is your ticket. And every weekday it gives you the chance to win £1,000 or £30,000 every weekend. And every month players in your postcode could win a share of £3 million. Join in at postcodelottery.co.uk slash radio before midnight on the 23rd of July to play in the August draws. PPL manage lotteries on behalf of good causes. 16 plus conditions apply. Play responsibly. Are you ready to play? This summer, ITV Hub is fully loaded with loads more full series. It's going to get messy. Yeah, like it's fuller than ever. From Love Island to Liar, we have divas lined up back to back. Feel me, it's sister. From the GC and the Ibiza Weekend, the reps, the Real Housewives is round full of lots and lots of... This is getting too much now. <sighs> Laughs, tears and smiles. It's crowned full with full series like Quiz, Flesh and Blood, Harry's Heroes and Max in Mumbai. We've grown, expanded and just gone a bit extra this summer. Give me some on. ITV Hub fully loaded this summer. The best experience possible. Did we mention it's looking fuller than ever? In line with government guidelines, face coverings are now compulsory on public transport. At Asda, you can get a full pack of Prima disposable face coverings for £2.80 or a two pack of washable face coverings from £2.50. Asda, we're all in this together. Selected stores subject to availability. Picture this. Small businesses on eBay are... Ploughing on. Boxing up goods and rolling them out. Shipping kettles. Instruments to kids. Art for walls. Treats to pets. Shorts for sunny weekends. To brighten up one British home at a time. Thousands of small businesses on eBay are helping to keep the nation going. They are individually brilliant, stronger as one. Buy, sell, eBay. Should your kids go back to school? Ask Andrea. She's a teacher. We're doing everything we can to keep the children safe and happy at school which is why it's great that more of those who can are coming back, not only for their education, but for their overall well-being too. It gives them a routine, helps develop their social skills, and they get to see their friends too. If your child is eligible, they should return to school. The government is working towards getting all pupils back in September. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Honda. We're not a car company. We're more of a listening company. And now our ears have brought our attention to where people feel most comfortable, the lounge. So we asked ourselves, what could Honda do to innovate in this space? Well, how about more space? Calm and uncluttered with modern yet retro styling and built-in screens compatible with your games console. It's the most comfortable lounge you've ever driven. Introducing the new Honda E, our small electric city car. Honda. The power of dreams. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Sponsored by Commonwealth Financial Network, delivering the support you need to enrich the lives of your clients and build the business you've always dreamed of. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. Stocks are attempting to recover some of the early lost ground on the back of gains in tech and tech-related shares as investors assess the economic and public health environment following the strong rally to start the week in yesterday's session. Uh, let's check the markets. Right now, S&P is little changed up almost two. The Dow is down six-tenths of a percent, down 150. And the Nasdaq is up seven-tenths of a percent, up 72. The 10-year is little changed with a yield of 0.67 percent. West Texas Intermediate Crude is up a tenth of a percent at 4067 a barrel, with Comex Gold up eight tenths of a percent at 1807.40 an ounce. The dollar yen, 107.53. The euro is $1.1297, and the British pound, $1.2589. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Vonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. 
The US housing market has been surprising economists. It rallied in the middle of the pandemic, but it's not the end of the story. Coronavirus may drag down home values after all this, according to CoreLogic. Let's bring in now our reporter who worked on the story with Prashant Gopal. John Gittleson, welcome to the program. John, in your story, you have looked at the CoreLogic data and you say that through May 2021, prices will fall about 6.6%. It doesn't sound like a massive drop, given that people are out of work and have haven't even been able to, to look at houses. Why 6.6%? Well, it's a combination of factors. I mean, there's still a lot of demand out there. There's a lot of millennials who are moving into the housing market. Interest rates are low, so affordability is still there. Um, <clears throat> even though unemployment is high, uh, the majority of people are still employed, and there's a lot of people who... Uh, you know, want bigger space, too. So many factors that uh, may have been brought into play by the coronavirus are supporting housing prices, uh, despite the huge impact on the economy. John, are there, you know, what we've seen in housing in the past, including the financial crisis, uh, 2008, 2009, was a, a, you know, a big difference regionally in the strength of the housing market. Are we seeing that today as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, this report broke out some major metro areas, and they said, for example, Las Vegas losing 20% in value. Um, and Las Vegas is its a big tourism mecca, obviously, and tourism is one of the areas that's being hit hardest. Um, and Las Vegas was also, according to CoreLogic, overvalued even before the crisis. Um, there's other areas like San Diego, they say, is only falling 1.3%. Um, <clears throat> New York area, and this is the metro area, not specifically, you know, Manhattan, but they're forecasting over the next 12 months or uh, about a 5.9% price decline. So... I guess this is the best case scenario. Um, as you say, some areas are going to experience huge declines like Las Vegas, for example. Does it depend on where the jobs are or where the jobs end up not being if there's some structural unemployment after all this? That's definitely a big part of the problem. Uh, and there's also going to be sort of unforeseen impact that's <clears throat> playing itself out every day. Do people want to live in suburbs? Can they work from home? Can they, uh, you know, do they want to have a bigger house? And so all of those types of things are, are going to affect where people move, where they buy, and where they sell. There's also the big demographic issue that even a, a pandemic can't stop, which is you've got aging baby boomers and you've got millennials moving into houses. So those big shifts in population are going to be a bigger factor even in the pandemic as people, you know, they're not stopping having babies. They're not stopping getting old and retiring. So, John, one of the themes that uh, I've heard about a lot over the last several years in, as it relates to housing is there's just not enough housing, entry-level housing. The housing that's being built today is perhaps, you know, more on the higher end of the market, and there's just not enough uh, entry-level housing being built and boomers maybe aren't moving out as quickly as they used to thereby creating a uh, you know supply demand imbalance on the lower end is that still the case yeah that's definitely the case affordability is a huge issue i mean that's why we have a lot of homeless people to begin with that's why a lot of people are living in apartments people are renting single family homes um but a big contrast with now and the you know 2008 financial crisis, there was a housing bubble going on. There was overproduction of housing then, and uh, there was a huge surplus that when people stopped paying their mortgages, people were underwater. They walked away from their homes. You don't have people walking away from their homes now because people have equity in their homes and because home prices have gone up, but production has not kept pace with demand. Does this all depend on a stock market that keeps going higher, John? If we saw, a, you know, a big correction, would we, you know, would that necessarily entail a very different housing market? Well, I think there's, you know, correlation, but not necessarily cause. Um, the wealth effect definitely makes people feel like, oh, I can afford to buy a home. I, you know, I, I feel like risking more. Uh, home sales did not 
stop, you know, in April and May when the stock market was tanking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who said, I can afford to do this now. I, I got my job and um, mortgage rates are so low because of the Fed intervention that actually something that, you know, uh, cost more than I would have been able to afford a couple of years ago is now actually affordable because I can get such a low interest rate on it. A 3% mortgage is a lot cheaper than a 4% mortgage. John, just real quickly, how, how, are the more, how is the mortgage market? Are people, are we seeing a lot of delinquencies? Um, they are definitely going up. Uh, there were like 9% of single family home loans were in forbearance. Um, not all of those are officially delinquent. So okay. they are rolling into delinquencies. Um, they're so much below the level that they were at the peak of the post financial crisis, yep. but they're heading in that direction. Interesting. John uh, Gittosan, thank you so much for that. Just getting a, a real solid across the board update on the housing market uh, in the United States. Uh, John Gittosan, a real estate and investing reporter for uh, Bloomberg News there. And, and Vani, I think the, you know, the housing market's generally held up pretty well here. And I guess that's, you know, predicated in large part upon, you know, historic low uh, interest rates. And that's, you know, kind of offsetting to some degree, as John was suggesting, the, uh, you know, the unemployment uh, that we're seeing out there in the United States. And that's going to bear uh, witnessing over the next uh, several months to see how that market plays out. We'll follow it certainly here. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Money Minute. The S&P 500 trading little changed as investors see a long way to go for the economy to get back on track. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic told the Financial Times that economic activity is showing signs of leveling off on a resurgence in coronavirus cases. The CEOs of Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet and Apple will testify on July 27th before a congressional panel investigating competition in the tech industry. The leaders are likely to face a torrent of critical questions from law lawmakers. Home prices will fall about 6.6% by May 2021, the first annual decline since 2012. That's according to a report by CoreLogic. And many Americans who cooked more at home during the pandemic aren't planning to stop. Nearly a third of adults surveyed by Bloomberg said they plan to cook at home even more than they do now once stay-at-home recommendations have been lifted, a blow to the restaurant industry. Courtney Donahoe, Bloomberg Radio. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Will it take for the economy to recover? How many of them have remained on the job throughout this? People are not going to be in public transportation. Nobody knows. You have received £600 million in the UK. But we can promise the most complete information and the most detailed analysis. The question is, what kind of recovery will it be? Through every twist and turn. Would you be wary of investment in China at this point? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. The world's financial decisions, decisions, clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. And action! I was offered one. Cut. That's not on the script. I was offered one. Get you. Ladies and gentlemen, I was offered one. Come, boy. I was offered one. Don't say can't work for it. Nine out of ten people said they were offered a great value deal with O2. Get yours today, in store, online, or by phone. I was offered one too. O2 Retail Exit Survey 309 of 348 agreed with the statement. O2 offered me a great value deal. For full verification, see o2.co.uk forward slash terms. London. 
Toolstation are here to help get your job safely started and finished with over 60 branches within the M25. All open with social distancing and contactless click and collect from five minutes and with 20,000 top trade quality products to choose from. Order online now for collection in London branches and get £5 off when you spend over £30 with the code LON530. So, get your job started at toolstation.com. Terms and conditions apply. Short on time? Don't worry. You can still get your cook on with Asda. Get three Asda ready meals for just £5.50. Like our beef lasagna or our tomato or mozzarella panette bake. Hang up your oven gloves. We've got dinner covered. Asda. Save money, live better. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Meals 400 grams, two pence ten each. When you buy tech online and you want to make sure you get exactly what you need, would you rather talk to a robot? Or to someone called Robert, or Ethan, or Kai, or Rachel, or one of our other tech experts on Shop Live, Curry's PC World's online video call experience. Hey, it's Ali. Can I give you a hand? Isn't it nice to get expert advice from another human being before you buy? They're just a click away. Curry's PC World. Talk to our tech experts online with Shop Live. What would the world be like if we listened more? At Honda, our ears are always open to new ideas. Oh, there's one now, knocking on our eardrum. What's that? What if we made a car with cameras instead of wing mirrors? A robot mower that knows when it's time to cut the grass. A self-balancing motorcycle. And what if by 2022, all of our mainstream cars were hybrid or electric? Huh. Great idea. Thanks, ears. Honda. The power of dreams. If you have to drive, then it's more important than ever to watch your speed. As London starts to reopen... There are going to be more people on our streets. There'll be more people cycling, more people walking to work or to the shops. If you must drive, avoid the morning and evening peaks when the roads will be busier. We want the streets to be safe for everyone all the time. So watch your speed. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Markets. This half hour, we're going to be talking deals. m and for the rest of the year. What will it look like in this environment? Rob Brown of Lincoln International joins us. We're also going to be talking about schools reopening, what that'll look like, where, with Andrea Gabor, who is Business Journalism Chair at Baruch College. First, let's get a Bloomberg Business Flash now. Here's Greg Jarrett. Money, the S&P is edging into positive territory, maybe I should say creeping into positive territory, led by gains in shares of tech heavyweights. Also, Regeneron, after news, won a government contract for mass production of a COVID antibody cocktail. Oil and gold also advanced alongside the surge in equities, while the dollar continues to ease off earlier gains. Uh, we check the markets every 15 minutes. The s and is little changed right now. The Dow is uh, down 7 tenths of a percent, down 178. And the NASDAQ is up 7 tenths of a percent, up 73. The 10 years little changed. The yield is 0.67 percent. West Texas Intermediate crude's up two tenths of a percent at forty seventy a barrel. Comex Gold is up three quarters of one percent at eighteen oh seven twenty an ounce. The dollar yen one oh seven fifty four. The euro a dollar twelve ninety eight and the British pound a dollar twenty five eighty three. Municipal bonds issued for the American Dream Mall and Entertainment Complex in New Jersey fell to 87 cents on the dollar yesterday in the first trade since May. That's down from as much as 100 cents in March. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Vonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Well, yesterday marked a little bit of a return to what we used to refer to as Merger Monday when you get a lot of deals announced, typically on a Monday after a weekend's worth of deal talks. We had uh, Warren Buffett uh, making a $10 billion bet on some energy assets, Uber. Uh, increasing its, uh, I guess, its footprint in the food delivery business. A couple of those deals yesterday to get a sense of kind of 
What the pandemic is doing to the M&A environment, we turn to Rob Brown. He's a managing director and CEO of North America for Lincoln International, based in Chicago. So, Rob, give us a sense, if you will, kind of what the M&A environment has been over the last several months as corporate CEOs and investment bankers try to gauge kind of what the pandemic means for the business climate. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, so if, if you dial back to the beginning of this year, uh, we entered this year really in one of the best M&A markets um, of the last probably 50 years, maybe ever. And so it was expected that the M&A activity would uh, continue at that pace through this year. Uh, and then the government reactions to COVID and really the stopping of the global economy, as you can appreciate, um, had a material effect on that. In fact, from March through May uh, in 2020 versus 2019, global M&A volume was down over 30 percent. Um, and so I think there was uh, just a pause. Let's take a wait and see. There were some deals that went forward, um, for sure. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now are buyers and sellers lifting their heads up and saying, okay, there are going to be deals that get done. And, and the two you mentioned that were announced yesterday were obviously very large deals. But really across the spectrum, what we're starting to see in the you know, 300 plus deals we have in backlog is that that the M&A market is returning. And I think the expectation is the back half of this year is going to be materially more active than the last three or four months. How have those deals in the works got repriced in the previous weeks, Bob? You know, many of them haven't. They, they've taken, if, if any, reduction in price. I think they've been small reductions because I think what's happened is uh, if you can show, hey, my business performed well during the downturn, my sector is a sector that may be more attractive or at least equally attractive as it was pre-COVID, uh, there's not a lot of value deterioration there because what you what you still have and what's really driving this, there's there's... Uh, as some estimates are close to a billion five of private equity capital available, what they call dry powder, and you layer on top of that the cash sitting on corporate balance sheets and a stock market that is still expecting these companies to grow when you look at the way the stock market and multiples are holding up. So I think the deals that are getting done right now, for the most part, are high-quality companies that are saying, listen, I performed well, I've shown I truly am essential, I've got a good business model that can withstand something like COVID. So we haven't seen a lot of, uh, of value deterioration on those businesses. There are some deals we're starting to see come to market, Bonnie, that are uh, lender-driven deals, maybe a company that wasn't performing well uh, pre-COVID and then COVID hit, and now they're really not performing well, and, and they're over-levered, and the lenders are starting to say, hey, we, we got to get paid, let's sell these. So we're starting to see a little bit of what we call distressed M&A, although interestingly, less of that than we may have thought, you know, given the real shock to the economy. So, Rob, when I think about uh, trends in M&A, it, to me, it's oftentimes a reflection of confidence, confidence from a CEO and a board about their business, maybe their sector, the overall economy. I can't imagine CEOs are that confident right now. So how are they thinking about M&A? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think what you're seeing the strategic acquires, the large corporate acquires, I think the way they're thinking about M&A is – you know, over the last four, five, six, seven years, they were under pressure to grow. They'd have organic growth. They'd supplement that with M&A. Their confidence in their business and their outlook was putting them in a position to maybe do acquisitions that are outside of their core businesses, adding another leg to the stool, expanding things. What we're seeing is, is that CEOs still feel that they need to grow. There's pressure to grow, and, and they can't hit their growth targets solely through organic. So they still want M&A to be part of that strategy. But what we're seeing is that lens shrinking, where the strategics and the CEOs are saying, I'm going to buy businesses that are in businesses I'm already in, where I know them, where there's really, really identifiable synergies that I can price. Uh, and I'm confident enough to do that. I think your point is the, the lack of visibility and maybe a lack of confidence in where this economy is going. I think that's going to limit some of those, let's get into new businesses, let's get into complementary areas for uh, strategic acquirers and CEOs. Briefly, Rob, any vertical or horizontal concerns regula regulation-wise? Will there be deals done before November just because we may see a different administration? Uh, 
Uh, maybe. I think the bigger driver for deals is we're in a relatively low tax environment. Mm. And, you know, if, 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 if the Democrats win, there may be a view that taxes are going to go up and capital gains taxes. Uh, that may not take effect until 2021. So I think a, a little less about the regulatory environment. We are hearing some people say, listen, I'd rather take the gain in a period of time where I know uh, capital gains rates are relatively low. So I, I think that could affect it. You know, you talk about regulatory, um, you know, what we're really seeing now in this administration, you know, the, the, the regulatory hurdle is really foreign investment, um, and, and particularly from Asia, where this administration doesn't like that. So, yeah. um, but, but I think from a regulatory standpoint, uh, you know, it's not clear um, how things would change if the administration changes. All right. Well, we have plenty of time to talk about that. That's for sure. Rob Brown is MD, the CEO of North America at Lincoln International, a middle market PE firm. Thanks for joining. Now let's get to Washington, D.C., our 99.1 studios, and Nathan Hager for World and National Headlines. Vani, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has tested positive for coronavirus. The South American leader and close ally to President Trump tells CNN Brazil he is, quote, perfectly well and is taking hydroxychloroquine despite the health risks. Bolsonaro had repeatedly called COVID-19 just a little flu in his campaign to reopen his country's economy. Brazil is second only to the U.S. for the most confirmed COVID-19 infections. White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Deborah Burke says statewide mask mandates can change the course of the U.S. pandemic. Burke spoke to Bloomberg Radio ahead of a White House roundtable on reopening schools. Working together at the state and local level and the federal level to learn from from each other of how we, with putting the child at the center and meeting their needs, were able to create that safe environment for both the families, the teachers, and the children. In time, the White House is pushing for no more than a trillion dollars of extra stimulus from Congress before lawmakers leave for summer recess early next month. Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff, Mark Short, also spoke to Bloomberg Radio. He says another nationwide shutdown is off the table. We can do both. We can make sure that America stays open and stays healthy. And I think that one of the things we've learned through this is there's also an enormous health consequence to shutting down the economy, whether or not that's a financial pain or whether or not that's a psychological pain for right. many people. Meantime, the percentage of COVID-19 tests coming back positive in hard-hit Florida jumped in the latest report today from 15% on Sunday to 16.3% as of yesterday. That is the highest positivity rate on record for Florida, undermining Governor Ron DeSantis argument that the crisis is not getting worse. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg. Quick take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. Debbie Hart is president of BioNJ, which represents the interests of more than 400 New Jersey-based biotech companies. She's also a strong voice in the biotech sector, supporting research universities like New Jersey Institute of Technology. She sees NJIT as a valuable partner in attracting venture capital and biotech startups to the Garden State. So the number one reason that companies come here to New Jersey for the biotech industry is for our talent. We estimate that there were about 30 biotech companies in the early 90s in New Jersey, about 80 in 1998. Today there are more than 400. And that growth continues and has come from every possible angle. Other countries, other states, they've spun out of our academic institutions as well as our biotech and our pharma companies. And we expect that growth to continue long into the future. And NJIT is a pipeline for talent for companies for entrepreneurs to do that important work. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. President of the Jewish Communal Fund, Zoya Rains, and her husband, Robert Friedman, Jewish activists and philanthropists, talk about why they chose the Jewish Communal Fund for their charitable giving. As very busy working parents, we wanted to focus more on the charity part of it and wanted to focus more on our children and less on the administration. The Jewish Communal Fund is one of the oldest and largest donor-advised funds, but at the same time, they are totally up-to-date and have state-of-the-art systems for us to access and manage our contributions online. The assets in our fund at the JCF grow tax-free, so we can generate more charitable dollars to support the charities that we care about most. Let JCF minimize your taxes and maximize your charitable giving. We're incredibly passionate about our charity, and the JCF allows us to focus more on the charity and less on the administration and the headaches. For more information about Jewish Communal Fund, visit our website at jcfny.org and request a new fund kit. 
if trying to figure out the future... The big Volkswagen event is now on. If you're after a new Volkswagen, we offer to pay your first three months finance payments and an additional 500 to a £1,000 contribution to your deposit at 3.8% APR representative. Hello, sir. Do any take your fancy? Well, yes, a new Golf or T-Cross. A Tiguan. No, Passat. Oh, I need to sit down. Here, have a seat. The big Volkswagen event. With every type of car on offer, you may have trouble choosing. With Solutions Personal Contract Plan until 12th of July, exclude T-Golf at participating retailers only. Minimum 46 months to receive three months finance payments. Indemnities may be required. Volkswagen Finance. Contact your local retailer to book an appointment. Hey, I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Curry's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. Just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town. So come in and talk laptops and washing machines or fridges and TVs. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC World. At Halfords, we're here to get you where you want to be. Why not get road ready with a free car check worth £15 at all our stores and garages? With 25,000 weekly slots available at 700 locations, you can count on us to get you safely back on the road. Or even back beside the seaside. From MOTs to tyre fittings, there's no job too big or too small. Halfords, for life's journeys. Eurotunnel Le Chateau is a safer way to get to France and beyond, with social distancing built in. There's no scrum at security, hanging around for your bags or shouldering strangers in your seat. With Eurotunnel Le Shuttle, simply drive on at Folkestone and stay in your car comfortably. Then drive off 35 minutes later. Stay safe. Go Tunnel. Eurotunnel Le Shuttle. A safer way to France and beyond. So I often struggled at school. Um, once, when we had a math test, I looked around the room and everyone was just doing it. And I couldn't and I began to cry. But my teacher came over and said, it might look like one big problem, but it's just a handful of small ones, and you can deal with that. I hear her voice in my head for every problem I face to this day. Teaching, every lesson shapes a life. You could get £26,000 tax-free to train as a teacher. Subject to eligibility, selected subjects only. Search Get Into Teaching. So, you've been holed up for a while. Not in here! The place has got a little, let's say, lived in... At Wix, we'll create your dream kitchen or bathroom from design to show off ready. And to keep everything safe, you can book a free virtual design appointment. Plus, now there's up to 50% off showroom kitchen units. Cure your house embarrassment safely with Wix. For more offer details, see wix.co.uk. In line with government guidelines, face coverings are now compulsory on public transport. At Asda, you can get a four-pack of Prima disposable face coverings for £2.80 or a two-pack of washable face coverings from £2.50. Asda, we're all in this together. Selected stores subject to availability. With millions of podcasts dropping new episodes all the time, how do you keep up with all your favourites? Tune in makes it easy. Simply head to the home screen and find your new episode section to see the latest additions. At Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Sponsored by Witham, a forward-thinking advisory and accounting firm helping clients to be in a position of strength in the new reality of business. Learn about their innovative solutions by visiting Witham.com. Stocks trade mixed with gains in tech shares, blunting the weakness in airlines and hotels. Mid signs the world's economy still has a long way to go to get anywhere near back on track. Let's take a look at the numbers. The S&P is currently little changed down one. The Dow is down six tenths of a percent, down 165. And the Nasdaq is up one half of one percent, up 55. The 10-year is up one thirty-second with a yield of 0.67 percent. West Texas Intermediate crude oil is up one half of one percent at 40.85 a barrel, with Comex Gold up eight tenths of a percent at 1807.60 an ounce. The dollar yen stands at 107.53. The euro is $1.1299. And the British pound, the dollar twenty-five seventy-nine. 
copper has erased its losses for the years. Pandemic-related disruptions tighten supplies as demand recovers. Thousands of workers have fallen ill in Chile, which accounts for more than a quarter of global copper supply amid a nationwide surge in infections. Meanwhile, demand is returning, led by signs of economic recovery and improving factory data in China. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. Bloomberg Opinion. Informed perspectives and expert data-driven commentary on breaking news. Online schooling has failed. American schools need to reopen in the fall. That's the contention of our next guest, Andrea Gabor, is Bloomberg Chair of Business Journalism at Baruch College in the city of New York. Also the author of After the Education Wars, How Smart Schools Upend the Business of Reform. Andrea, thanks so much for joining. If there is a risk of children getting COVID-19 in the classroom, how could anybody send their kid back into the classroom? Well, you know, first off, there's a risk with everything, and children, uh, has, it's been pretty well proven that they are less at risk uh, than adults, both of, both of, contract, of, both of contracting the virus uh, and of spreading it. And you have to keep in mind that there is a overwhelming um, argument for kids being back in the classroom, which is why the American Academy of Pediatrics gave unequivocal guidance um, to do everything uh, possible to restart some in-person instruction. And by the way, it's also why doing this in a very measured and thoughtful way that is um, really thinking through the parameters of everything from what does the classroom look like to how do you load school buses is also extremely important. Mm. So, Andrea, you know, it's interesting. I have, uh, you know, one child in high school and, and you know, a couple of children in, uh, in college. And for the college kids, you know, the virtual learning, to me, while obviously it's not ideal, it's, it's okay. Uh, but I feel like for the younger kids, boy, that they really need to be in the classroom. And I, and I think about it, even even younger than high school, because my high schooler did just fine virtually. But, boy, it seems like those younger, the younger you go, Andrea, the more important it is to be in the classroom. Is that kind of what the data is suggesting? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Carol Burris, who is a award-winning uh, New York State principal, um, you know, I quote her in the article, and, you know, she is just unequiv unequivocal, and so is the data that small children, um, they need to stay away from screens, and they really can't learn that way. And I'll tell you, you know, you know I'm, I'm a college professor. It's hard even at the college level to engage um, older uh, young adults, and you know there are there's going to be a cohort of high school kids and college kids who function well online. Okay, there is a cohort that does that well. Um, but my guess is, and I don't know the data on this, but the majority don't um, that they don't learn quite as well, even when things are really well thought out. And keep in mind that the pandemic caused this sudden shift without any preparation at all. Um, and we have vast swaths of the country, um, both in poor neighborhoods in cities and in rural areas throughout the South and the West, um, where Internet access is really practically non-existent, um, uh, where kids either don't have access to Internet or don't have access to electronic devices. So it's incredibly problematic. And as you say, for small children, it is really pedagogically a disaster. Is there an intelligent way of doing this that you've seen laid out by any state in the union, Andrea? I mean, obviously there would have to be, you know, certain groups on certain days. Maybe the teachers also have to rotate. But has anybody come up with a good plan? Okay. So we're not really going to know until they put these plans into action. I mean, it is sort of building the airplane while you're flying in the air. Um, Interestingly, California and New Jersey have put out, and actually a lot of states have put out guidance. Um, I've looked fairly closely at California and New Jersey, and they're really thoughtful. Um, you know, they propose things like uh, students meeting, uh, you know, two days a week in person, um, two days a week at home to, again, achieve that social distancing. They propose... Um, literally very fine-grained suggestions for how you load and unload school buses. Um, New Jersey suggests, for example, that every um, school set up a pandemic response team to sort of centralize um, and expedite any kind of COVID-19 decision-making. 
and they go on to say that that these these teams have to uh, be very representative and include teachers and parents and staff, right? Because you need the input from all those groups. But in fact, I think one lesson we're probably going to come away with is that for this to work, because we've already seen teachers' unions pushing back, for this to work, you have to engage the teachers, you have to engage the parents, the staff. Um, you know, and as I was writing this piece, one of the things that just kept hammering at my brain is that teachers and educators, and I consider myself among them, are essential workers. If nurses are essential workers and grocery delivery people and slaughterhouse workers are essential, then teachers really are essential workers. And the, the, the challenge then becomes, you know, how do you begin to bring back some in-person uh, education safely? And, of course, there's a larger societal question, um, which I think you can get into in the article, which is, do we want to open up schools for in-person instruction or bars, right? I mean, if bars are spreading hmm. yep. the pandemic, then maybe... We should be keeping bars closed and keeping, you know, trying to open schools. So we really, really as a society need to think about what our priorities are. Mm. Andrea, just broadly speaking, how are the teachers feeling about the whole concept of going back to school? Are they supportive of it, if it can be done safely? Or are they just saying, listen, I'm just not that comfortable with it? Look, I think there are a lot of... Um, I think there are a lot of teachers, and we're hearing a lot of squeaky wheels um, uh, who are saying, no, no, it's not safe. We shouldn't go back. But, you know, there are also a lot of, you know, and, and, and they are also probably dedicated, dedicated, very dedicated teachers. But you have to keep in mind that the history in this country, and we saw that in the Red for Ed movement, was a lot of teacher bashing, you know, low, low pay, um, not listening to educators, trying to impose top-down solutions in everything from curriculum to, you know, now perhaps, you know, how we reopen. The reality is that teachers are professionals, okay? There are risks associated with reopening. And if you want to do this in a smart way, you're going to have to engage teachers in the solution. And teachers are going to have to be part of that solution, as, as are unions. So I think there's probably a mix of how teachers feel about this. Yep. They have to be part of the solution. Have to be part of the solution. Andrea uh, Gabor, thank you so much for joining us. Andrea is a Bloomberg Chair of Business Journalism at Brew College of the City, University of New York. Also a Bloomberg Opinion contributor, and we uh, welcome her thoughts as we think about reopening the schools in the fall. And that is obviously a huge issue for everyone out there as they think about reopening the economy. you got to reopen the schools, but you have to do it safely. Uh, coming up, Bloomberg Balance of Power with David Weston. Coming up in just moments, this is Bloomberg. In addition to Bloomberg Radio, you can catch the latest news and biggest newsmakers on Bloomberg Television. Look for us on Direct TV Channel 353 or check your local listings. In this pandemic, everyone wants... Hey, I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Curry's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. Yay! Just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town. So come in and see if that vacuum can take care of your well-trodden home. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC World. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. So, you've been holed up for a while. Not in here! The place has got a little, let's say, lived in. At Wix, we'll create your dream kitchen or bathroom from design to show off ready. And to keep everything safe, you can book a free virtual design appointment. Plus, now there's up to 50% off showroom kitchen units. 
Secure your house embarrassment safely with Wix. For more offer details, see wix.co.uk. If you have to drive, then it's more important than ever to watch your speed. As London starts to reopen, there are going to be more people on our streets. There'll be more people cycling, more people walking to work or to the shops. If you must drive, avoid the morning and evening peaks when the roads will be busier. We want the streets to be safe for everyone all the time. So watch your speed. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Looking to freshen up your listening on TuneIn? Head to the homepage to discover something new. There you'll see custom recommendations based on your listening habits, along with new episodes of shows you've enjoyed in the past. Uncover your next audio obsession on the homepage. Four hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is Bloomberg Radio. From New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start once again today with Kaylee Lyons for a report on the market. So, Kaylee, taking a little money off the table today after that nice run-up yesterday? Yeah, it's been a bit of a mixed session, David. We've seen some fluctuations. Basically, what this looks like to me is a market that is very seriously weighing the perhaps rollback in the recovery and reopening story as we see virus cases rise. That is putting a bit of a dent into risk appetite, but we're being carried largely by the mega cap tech names. You're seeing that reflected in the fact that the NASDAQ is outperforming to a large degree. It's up by about half of 1%. The S&P 500 was brought higher by some of those big tech names earlier in the session. It is right now down by less than one-tenth of 1%, where the underperformance is coming in is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Those industrial names, of course, more sick economically sensitive, and then small caps as well as they're domestically focused. The stocks that aren't as sensitive to that economic story are the likes of Apple and Microsoft, high growth names that have very strong balance sheets, a lot of cash on hand, and we're seeing continued investor preference for these stocks. Both Apple and Microsoft hit fresh records today. Interestingly, Amazon did earlier today, too. It is now actually lower by about four-tenths of one percent on news about the launch of Walmart Plus, which is its rival to compete with Amazon Prime. But longer term, all of these are stocks that have widely outperformed the broader market this year and have contributed the largest chunk on a points basis to the gains we've seen so far. And they're really all that's holding us up in today's session as well, David. Yeah, just what we need is one more streaming service. Do you have a sense, Kaylee, of how much of this might be attributable to the strength or the weakness of the dollar? What's the dollar doing? Because there's some perception right now that maybe some countries like in Europe and in Asia are doing a better job than we are on COVID-19. Well, on the dollar today, it really is roughly flat. It has been a pretty interesting proxy for risk appetite. You're not really seeing that reflected today. But to your point about Europe and China and the kind of outperformance we have seen in some of those markets as they're interpreted as perhaps having a superior response to the virus than the U.S. has had, I would note that they're really, I mean, China to a certain degree, but not Europe. They don't have big tech. So, and a lot of what has contributed to U.S. equity exceptionalism is the fact that tech names make up more than a quarter of the S&P 500, for example. So if that's where investors are seeking safety, seeking some defense from this virus, they kind of have to be in U.S. big tech names, David. Okay, thank you so much to Kaylee Lines for that report on the markets. As Kaylee suggests, the markets can't get too far away from that COVID-19. And the number of COVID-19 cases across the country are really rising in most places right now. And it raises questions about uh, how, what's the cause of that rise and also how concerned should we be about it. For some answers to those questions now, we welcome Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He's professor of medicine at Stanford University. So welcome, doctor. It's great to have you with us. Uh, let's start with a basic question that seems to be around today that, okay, maybe the cases are going up and maybe going up at an alarming rate, but the, the deaths are not going up as much. Should that give us some comfort? I mean, I think it should give us some comfort because uh, it, it points to two different things that I think are, are in some sense, I wouldn't say good news, but at least not not bad news. So first, uh, the cases are going up partly because there was there were these protests uh, also, lockdown fatigue. I think people are people have been moving around more than even even despite lockdown orders. Uh, but that's that's mainly been focused on younger populations. Older po populations who are dying from the disease earlier in the epidemic are seem to we seem to be doing a better job protecting them from getting the disease. And as a result, the death rates are coming down because when a younger person gets the disease, they they die at much lower rates than when an older person gets it. 
Are we improving the treatment as well? I mean, is that helping some to keep more people alive who actually contract the disease? Yeah, I think we've learned a lot in the last few months. Um, I mean, obviously, there's no cure and there's no vaccine, so we still have a long way to go. But I think for people who are being treated in the hospital, we're better at managing them. Uh, we're better at using things like steroid therapy, ventilators. There are these innovative new technolo newer technologies like uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO, which, which is a way to provide the, uh, oxygen without having to do a ventilation. Uh, expensive, but uh, for severe cases, really, really potentially effective. Um, so I think we've learned a lot about treating patients, and we're doing better at it. Doctor, you mentioned vaccine, and everybody is hoping for that vaccine sooner rather than later. At the same time, we heard from Dr. Fauci yesterday, who was a little cautious about it, said, okay, if and when we get a vaccine, don't count on it being like the measles vaccine, where you take it once, it all goes away. It may be a little more complicated than that. Do you agree with that? Did that come as a surprise to you? No, I think that's. I think that caution is, is warranted. Uh, we don't have a coronavirus vaccine for any other of the coronaviruses. Uh, it's a difficult technical challenge, and we're trying to, in very, very, real, you know, real time, trying to d discover brand new things. If it works, it's great. I mean, I'll, I'll look at the data and I'll, I'll be, I'll line up to take it. If it doesn't work, I, I mean, we we don't know. It's a gamble. Uh, why is it that it appears right now that a lot of other countries around the world are doing a lot better job than we are? I mean, people point to China, of course, the first one, but also in Europe. I mean, Italy, places like that had terrible situations with the virus, and yet they seem to have done better than we are. Is that a fair comparison? And if it is, why are we lagging? I mean, I, I think first China and, and Europe went through the epidemic earlier than we did. So they're at a later stage of the epidemic than we are. If we're where they are in a month, then everyone will say we're doing a good job. I mean, I think it's it's a long run question, not a not an intermediate or short run question about how well countries did. Uh, there's also, as far as like uh, Asia, China, it, there's there's questions about uh, sort of whether the same exact virus. The, I mean, there was a there's literature that suggests there were viral mutations that made the vir virus more uh, uh, more. Uh, 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 you know, sort of had, had higher, not, not lethal, higher um, infectiousness that infected Europe and and, uh, and the U.S. than than Asia. So, I mean, it's it's actually still unclear. The science is out on why some countries did better than others. Uh, so, so, Doctor, one of the things that a lot of Americans are looking f forward at right now, maybe not to, but at, is school, school reopening in the fall, whether it's higher education like Stanford, for example, or public schools. We talked with Deborah, uh, Deborah Burks, a doctor who is the senior advisor to the White House, about what we could do to keep schools safe. This is what she told Bloomberg earlier today. We have to bring in testing into the schools as well as you described, creating a healthy environment and really working together at the state and local level and the federal level to learn from each other of how we, with putting the child at the center and meeting their needs, were able to create that safe environment for both the families, the teachers, and the children. So a safe environment, that certainly sounds good, Doctor. Is that doable as a practical matter? I mean, what will that take for us to have a safe environment for the schools come fall? I think it's doable. I mean, I think uh, other countries have started to reopen their schools, partly on the strength of scientific evidence that suggests that uh, children are much less likely to pass on the virus to uh, adults when they get it, uh, and that, that, of course, that kids are, uh, are, are face much lower risk from the virus. Uh, it is absolutely not just doable, but absolutely vital, because our children's uh, education isn't just our children's education; it's our it's our future. Uh, it's it's their future, and in a sense, we need to develop ways so that they we don't rob them of of uh, something that we owe them, which is a good education. Um, I think, uh, it, as far as safe safe schools, I think testing um, teachers and kids is a good idea. I think uh, uh, thinking of ways to maintain social distancing is a good idea. Um, Mass will be tough, I think, in, in primary schools because you know, I mean, I've had uh, I've had little children and having the, the idea of them not uh, they lose their jackets all the time. Will they lose their their masks when they go to school? I think that'll be that'll be more difficult. But I think uh, we're innovative and creative, and I think uh, uh, throughout the country, I think people will discover new ways of of keeping people safe, keeping kids safe, and the teachers safe as we reopen the schools. Dr. Bhattacharya, has Stanford announced its plans for the fall? We heard, I think, from Harvard and Princeton yesterday, they're going to have severe restrictions on capacity, that, you know, people will come back, but boy, not all at the same time, and they won't be there all the time. 
Yeah, so Stanford has less restrictive plans than what I understand Harvard is doing. Uh, so Stanford's plans involve having two classes, two out of the four classes on campus every quarter. Um, many of the classes, probably you know, the, the majority of them, will be off on on um, uh, online, on, you know, through through video conferencing. But there will be some on in in in. Uh, in-person classes, especially I think lab classes will be impossible to run, uh, uh, you know, unless you are actually there in person. Um, so I think uh, there's there's a there's a mix. Uh, as I say, I think we're going to think of innovative ways to, to protect our kids while giving the kids educate the education they deserve. Uh, whether this is a continuing first wave that's coming up again in the United States right now, even as we speak, or whether we're contemplating a second wave perhaps in the fall when the fuel flu season comes around, how are our hospitals set up for this now? Obviously, they were hit really hard last uh, in March and into April. Uh, are we in better position now to deal with a second wave or a continuation, an exacerbation of the first wave? I mean, this is something I've worried a lot about. Uh, I think the first wave, what happened was uh, many hospitals essentially were shut down. They were empty while uh, waiting for the, for the. For, I mean, it's not New York in, the, in some places, but most of the country. And that created a lot of financial pressure. So the, the, the hope is that we can keep these hospital systems going that face this financial pressure of being empty for extended periods of time um, so that when the second wave hits, I, I mean, I don't even know, call it the third wave. We're kind of going to the second wave now. Um, the, when, the, when that wave hits, the hospital systems are, are working and functioning. I think in some ways, though, we, we, we are better at uh, expanding capacity. We, we've, um, I, I, I worry about places like Arizona and uh, Houston and even to some extent L.A., um, where we're seeing big surges in hospitalization. But I, I'm not seeing evidence as yet uh, of the kind of overwhelming that we saw in Bergamo. We're not seeing uh, expansions in, in, in infections that occur at hospitals that are indicative of, of, uh, of, being, of a system being overwhelmed. Um, and uh, I think patients are, for the most part, getting care. I think there are, there are hot spots we absolutely need to be aware, wary of and make sure that we provide support to. Okay, doctor, thank you so very much for being with us. That was truly helpful. That's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He is professor of medicine at Stanford University. And coming up here, we're going to talk to the lieutenant governor of the state of New York, Kathy Hochul, about what we're doing to try to make sure we don't backslide. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm Robin, one of the tech experts here to help you at Curry's PC World. I'm not just a voice on the radio. You can now come into your local store and talk tech with a human being like me. Yay! Just the news you needed this afternoon. We've put all the right measures in place to help you again safely in your local Staples Corner store. The tech experts are back in town. So come in and see if that vacuum can take care of your well-trodden home. And welcome back to your local Curry's PC World. At Halfords, we're here to get you where you want to be. We fit car tyres for over half a million customers every year. We could fit yours at one of over 350 garages or even on your driveway with our mobile experts, which means you can safely hit the road again and surprise that special someone. Happy, Happy birthday! birthday. <laughs> From tyre fittings to MOTs, there really is no job too big or too small. Halfords, for life's journeys. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Stocks edge a bit lower, but gains in tech shares have blunted the weakness in airlines and hotels amid signs the world's economy has a long way to go. Two stocks fell on the S&P for everyone that gained, though the gauge did edge higher as heavyweights such as Microsoft and Apple and Facebook rose, sending the Nasdaq to a record. Uh, we check the numbers every 15 minutes throughout the trading day. The S&P is down two tenths of a percent, down six. The Dow is down eight tenths of a percent, down 204. And the Nasdaq is up three tenths of a percent, up 30. The 10 year is up 430 seconds with a yield of 0.66 percent. West Texas Intermediate crude is up a half a percent at 4083 a barrel, with Comex Gold up nine tenths of a percent at 1808.90 an ounce. The dollar yen 107.51. The euro is $1.1297 and the pound is $1.2574. Now well, that is a Bloomberg business flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. Now, more balance of power with David Weston right here on Bloomberg Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, has tested positive for the coronavirus. President Bolsonaro told CNN Brazil that he's taking hydroxychloroquine and that he's feeling fine. The 65-year-old president, who during his campaign to reopen the economy, called the virus, quote, just a little flu, has repeatedly disobeyed medical recommendations to avoid contamination, mingling in crowds without a face mask and giving people handshakes. Brazil has become a global hotspot for the virus, second only to the United States in cases and deaths. Hong Kong is seeing its biggest number of coronavirus cases in nearly three months, stumping local health officials. There are only nine new cases, but it is a setback for Hong Kong, a city that had largely succeeded in containing the virus for months. The new cases come two weeks after the government's latest easing of social distancing restrictions. The White House wants Congress to pass another stimulus package by the first week in August before lawmakers head home for their annual summer recess. That's according to Vice President Pence's chief of staff, Mark Short, who also tells Bloomberg the president wants to keep the cost at $1 trillion or less. Short says the White House views liability protections as, quote, essential for companies to bring workers back and to fully reopen the U.S. economy. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul of New York has been at the center of New York's efforts to turn back the tide of COVID-19 from the beginning. And we welcome her now back to Balance of Power. So welcome, Lieutenant Governor. I must say, you've done it with Governor Cuomo and the rest of the team. It's really the numbers have come down. They aren't gone altogether, we heard yesterday from Governor Cuomo, but it's certainly holding down. At the same time, it's coming up, not just in the southwest and the south, but also in New Jersey a bit now. What, what can we do to make sure we don't go back to the bad old days? Well, thank you for having me back on the show again, David. And yes, the bad old days, that was a trip to hell and back, and we never want to revisit that uh, that road trip again. And the governor has talked about how we scaled the mountain, and we have come down to the other side of the mountain. And the last thing we want to do is actually turn that into a mountain range where we have to start heading up again. But to answer your question, what we can do, we have been on a very thoughtful path to slowly reopen the economy based on the health metrics of each of the regions. We didn't do a one-size-fits-all for the state. We have identified the fact that there is a, many parts of New York State that could reopen. In fact, you could have indoor dining and most services provided you know, outside New York City. New York City, as you know, we went to phase three just yesterday, but eliminated indoor dining because it is a risk that we don't want to take. So we're going to continue following the science, the data, the experts, and not making decisions based on emotion or politics or whatever you get up in the morning and you want to do and say, well, let's reopen. And uh, you know, we respect that. And that is why New York has been very successful. Plus, we also have the tour travel quarantine of 19 states now because we have to protect New Yorkers. They have sacrificed too long and hard to have any reversal of our, our position now. And it's risky. It is a very risky situation. We still feel vulnerable. And we're going to protect the progress that we've made. Let's talk about that quarantine and some numbers here. As I say, adjoining New Jersey reported, Governor Murphy reported yesterday, they've gone up above one on that classic R not number, which means it's spreading in there. And the, the claim was, at least, that a lot of that's coming because people are coming from outside, from hotspots outside of New Jersey. How can New York effectively enforce that quarantine against all those states where there are hotspots? We hear all sorts of anecdotal stories about people coming from Florida, South Carolina, Arizona. What you have is a situation where many New Yorkers, they have homes in warmer climates. They start making their return from Arizona and Florida, usually in May or June. They may have stayed a little bit longer this year. But even in some rural parts of New York State, I, I've, I've been managing the reopening around the Buffalo area particularly, some very small communities that had no cases whatsoever, it turns out that these snowbirds brought it back from Florida. But the, it's a complicated response to try and manage this. We are identifying people flying in from these states at the airports, letting them know the warnings. They're very much aware that their responsibility to quarantine literally for two weeks upon their arrival. 
and people driving here, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, self-reporting. People understand our rules, but also there are neighbors who are going to be saying, well, I see uh, my neighbor is back from Florida, and I'm seeing them in the grocery store. So we've asked for our local authorities to be involved, but there's just many different ways that we're going to try and enforce this. But it's really important that people adhere to this. Again, New York was the epicenter. The entire globe was watching how we managed this crisis in the early days of March and April and May. And, you know, it's, it's a place we don't want to go back to. It's, it's too excruciatingly painful to think about what we came through, and we have to do everything in our power to protect that progress. And so other states are a risk to us. And you even think about places like Texas, where the leadership, uh, the lieutenant governor is very cavalier about their response and saying they're going to ignore Dr. Fauci. I mean, really? This is, he's one of the few people we trust to listen to in Washington on this. I mean, where are we going with that? So there's a lot that's going on outside New York. And, you know, we can't just seal it up and protect it, but we'd like to because New Yorkers have been too They've gone too far, they've sacrificed too much, and we're not going backwards. As you say, Kathy, it is both complicated and painful. If that's not enough, let me inject another complicated, painful one, and that is crime. Because as a combination, perhaps, of people being pent up so long and wanting to get outside, also the aftermath of George Floyd and the demonstrations and some of the real concerns about policing. How do we strike the right balance, particularly in New York City? Because there has been a noticeable uptick in crime here. What is the right way to get the balance of effective policing, human policing that it respects people in a time of COVID-19 and some of the real unrest? You're absolutely right. We're sort of experiencing it experiencing a toxic brew right now where you have the uh, fatigue from having to endure the pandemic where people literally lost their jobs or if they're frontline workers, the stress they have of putting on their uniform and running into the heat of battle every day. And when they come home, are they going to infect their family? So the human emotions have been raw through this. It's been so challenging for New Yorkers. Fireworks every single night. And then the protests associated with our, the legitimate fight for police reform, and the governor has been a champion of this from way before this, but has you know, put, positioned New York State in a leadership role where others are looking to us for what we've accomplished here. And then there's just this inherent tension. You lost your job, there's stress, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of anxiety, and the violence is escalating. The governor has offered to work with the local police department, the NYPD, and bring in the resources of the state police to assist working with district attorneys, and we are lending the full support of New York State to try and get that very volatile situation under control. Again, we just want to get back to normal, but normal's not going to happen while there's still a pandemic, and we're just constantly asking New Yorkers to do more. You know, can you hold on a little bit longer? And well, okay, now you can get your hair cut, but you can't eat in a restaurant. You can't go to the gym yet. They have to continue doing this. They have to keep wearing the mask. They have to keep social distancing to make sure we don't slide backwards. But when you think about what we've asked them to do over these months, uh, it's, it's, it's understandable why there's such incredible tension right now in the city of New York. Yeah, nobody said you had an easy job. I think it's fair to say that is Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul of the state of New York. And coming up on this program, we're going to sit down with Wes Moore. He's the head of Robin Hood Foundation, fighting poverty, but also has a powerful new book out on the question of policing and inequality of America. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Have you wanted to speak a new language? Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. At Halfords, we're here to get you where you want to be. We can replace your battery at over 700 stores and garages, or even at your home or work with our mobile experts, so you can enjoy an engine that starts first time, every time. And start enjoying the open road again. Are we nearly there yet? From battery replacements to tyre fittings to MOTs, there really is no job too big or too small. 
Halfords for life's journeys. In line with government guidelines, face coverings are now compulsory on public transport. At Asda, you can get a full pack of Prima disposable face coverings for £2.80 or a two pack of washable face coverings from £2.50. Asda, we're all in this together. Selected stores subject to availability. I was offered one. I was offered one. Who are you? Yeah, I was offered one who? One, two, one, two. I was offered one. I was offered one. Don't take our word for it. Nine out of ten people said they were offered a great value deal with O2. Get yours today, in store, online, or by phone. I was offered one too. O2 Retail Exit Survey 309 of 348 agreed with the statement. O2 offered me a great value deal. For full verification, see o2.co.uk forward slash terms. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our stock of the hour today is Bayer. Just when I thought it had that big problem with Roundup behind it with a $12 billion settlement, the judge put his hand up and said, I'm not sure I like this settlement very much. And here report on how that's hurt their stock. Is Scarlet Fu. Scarlet? Yeah, that's a pretty ugly stock chart there, David. I still think of uh, Bayer as a pharma company. It invented aspirin, after all, but after its purchase of Monsanto in 2018, it's really an agriculture company. It still gets about 12% of its sales from seeds and also 12% from herbicides. And that is haunting Bayer right now because it's trapped in this legal mess tied to claims that Roundup uh, causes cancer. There have been three jury trials held in the last two years, and the company lost all three and is appealing those cases. Back to June, where there was that breakthrough, Bayer agreeing to pay almost $11 billion to settle 100,000 lawsuits, the largest settlement in pharma history. This week, the judge who oversaw that litigation expressed doubt about one part of the settlement, which is Bayer's proposal to deal with future claims. It's really unique here because Bayer's going to set up an independent scientific panel to determine whether Roundup causes cancer, rather than leave that decision to independent judges and juries. And if the panel finds there's no link, class members can't move forward with their suits. If the panel says there is a link, then future Roundup users can proceed with their suits. So the judge is saying that this is problematic, and he says he's tentatively inclined to reject it, David. If he rejects it, does that make the whole settlement go away? Yeah, that's the big question here. And what we understand right now is that it does not jeopardize that initial uh, settlement of almost $12 billion. So the 100,000 cases is not put into jeopardy, but it really reinforces concern among investors that buyer just can't get past the mountain of litigation and resolve this once and for all. From an investor point of view, the Monsanto purchase has been terrible. Within the first year of its purchase, buyer stock fell by almost half. It had to take drastic action. It cut 12,000 jobs. It had to sell the animal health business, uh, big brands including Coppertone and Dr. Scholl's. And by March, its market cap was less than the $63 billion it spent to buy Monsanto. So that just gives you a sense of the pain involved there. Okay. Thank you so much to Scarlet Fu. Coming up here on Balance of Power, we get to talk with Wes Moore, the head of the Robin Hood Foundation. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. U.S. stocks are trading mixed with gains in tech shares, blunting weakness in airlines and hotels. The Dow is falling 175 points. NASDAQ is up 56. S&P 500 is flat. The White House wants Congress to pass another stimulus package of up to a trillion dollars by the first week in August before lawmakers head home for the summer recess. We're a little more than halfway through 2020, and the number of companies going bankrupt have skyrocketed. The coronavirus pandemic has pushed more than 3,600 businesses into Chapter 11. That's about 26% more than last year. And one of the front runners in the race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine will receive $1.6 billion from the government to develop its experimental shot. The funds will allow Novavax to deliver 100 million doses by late 2020. Donna Wilson, Bloomberg Radio. Hey, y'all, Jeff Foxworthy here. Now, if you've ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over for 75 years, you might be Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. That's why I'm filling in for Smokey to switch things up, because there's a lot more to say. And I should know because my grandfather was a firefighter. And one of the things he taught me is that the people that love the outdoors the most are often the ones accidentally starting wildfires, which means always (laughs) BYOB. No, bring your own bucket to the campfire. 
and be extra careful with things like burning yard trimmings. Don't just walk away, or chances are you might be starting a wildfire. So for the love of the outdoors, go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative, and that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. Gathering world-renowned experts takes effort. We have the perfect person. Asking them the right questions takes Carol Masser and Jason Kelly. Is this possibly early indications of a second wave? Bloomberg Business Week. Silicon Valley will be forever changed by this pandemic. What's your take? Are they paying off their balances? Weekday afternoons at 2 Eastern. That is a significant shift. On Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I am David Weston. A black man dies at the hands of a police officer, leading to protests and even looting and some rioting. It happened this spring in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. But it also happened other times as well in our history, sadly. And one of them was five years ago, right about now, in Baltimore. And it's been all told in a compelling new book called... Uh, five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City. We're wel- we welcome now the author of that book. He is Wes Moore. He is the, the p- CEO of Robin Hood Foundation here in New York, a poverty-finding organization. So, Wes, thank you so much for coming here. Let's start with the most basic. What's your connection to this story, to Freddie Gray, who was killed five years ago in the back of a police van in Baltimore? Well, I'm a, I'm a Baltimore native, and in many ways, Baltimore City helped to raise me. Uh, and I, I, one of the things that really struck me about Freddie's story was, you know, I, I, I unfortunately have been to many funerals before my life, but his funeral was the first funeral that I had ever been to when the person who was laying in the casket, I never knew in life. And that haunted me. Uh, because Freddie Ray's funeral was a big deal in Baltimore. Uh, but then the thing that really helped to, to, to trigger wanting to write this book and tell this story was, uh, was not just the horror of his death, but in many ways the horror of his life. And that's what I, what I, wanted, to unca- what I wanted to uncover. And you say, I'll just read a bit from the prologue here. You say, we had come from similar places, you and Freddie Gray, but I had been so fortunate, so blessed. And you go on to talk about your mother and your grandparents and the breaks you got along the way. How does it happen that two people with similar sorts of situations can take such divergent paths? Well, you know, I, I think that one of the things I wanted to be able to look at is when you look at the life of Freddie Gray, for, for so much of us, particularly for individuals, all of us, who feel like we're coming out from the margins, right, where, where this wasn't always destined, that we, we could end up being there. There are a lot of factors that play into it, but one of the big factors that plays into it, unfortunately, is luck. It's, it's ha- getting, getting a break that someone else might not get, an opportunity that someone else might not get. And, and the idea that we would have or can have a society that is relying on luck as a prerequisite in order for people to be able to move from one position to another to another position is really hard. And you think about Freddie's life in particular. Uh, you know, Freddie was born premature, underweight, addicted to heroin, uh, his mother never made it to high school. She couldn't read or write. She has these twins, Freddie and his twin sister, Frederica. By the time they had gained enough weight to actually leave the hospital, they moved into a housing project in West Baltimore that had endemic levels of lead inside of the home. And so Freddie Gray is now underweight, addicted to heroin, lead poisoned. And by this time in his life, he's two years old. And so it gets back to this larger point of, did Freddie Gray even have a chance? Did he even have a shot? Or was that last interaction that he had where, where he was where he, he died and was killed in police custody for the crime of making eye contact with police, which triggered probable cause? Uh, was that a just what the last system to break in the life of Freddie Gray? 
Well, see, that's what I found. One of the things I found very powerful in this book is uh, obviously what happened with the police was inexcusable. Police officers were indicted, although I don't think they were convicted. But it was inexcusable what happened in that police van. But the problem of Freddie Gray started way past that. And when you talk about systems, we talk about systemic racism, systemic inequality. It's a series of systems. There's a lot of systems here that put Freddie Gray in the wrong place. And for that matter, put police in the wrong place at the same time. That's exactly right. I mean, when you look at the life of Freddie Gray, every every system failed him. Uh, you know, the education system, when, when the, the last day of, of attendance that he had recorded in Baltimore City Public Schools uh, was in 10th grade when he was 19 years old. He had been in special education developmental coursework his entire academic career because of the lead poisoning. The CDC indicates that five microbes of lead in every deciliter of blood is enough to give a person cognitive damage for the rest of their life. Freddie Gray had 36. And so this was a young man who from the earliest ages, from, from, from being a toddler, was going to be cognitively damaged for the rest of his life because of something he had absolutely zero to do with. And that was that the fact that the home that he was living in and the water that he was drinking was making him sick. And so when you're looking at all these various systems that then were in place and just were not in place in the life of Freddie Gray, uh, it, it forces all of us to understand that this is not just going to be about policing. Reforming the police department is, is, is necessary and it is imperative. However, we also have to understand that the amount of systems and the amount of touches that Freddie Gray had in broken systems throughout led to the, to the idea that that last interaction with the broken system, with that one broken system, uh, was just kind of a continuation of a lot of the larger life challenges that he was facing. And I want to take us through some of the concrete steps, because you have concrete steps in your book that should be taken. But before that, this is a story about Freddie Gray, but it's also the story about eight other individuals. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting, compelling way to tell the story, sort of Rashomon, from different people's points of view at the time over those critical five days uh, that were really Baltimore was on fire. Give us a sense of some of those characters that you identify. I tell you, David, it was one of the things that I absolutely loved about this story, because if, if Baltimore, Baltimore is one thing, it's full of characters. And I was hearing it from every single strata of our society about what people thought about what happened and, and what were the lessons learned. And, and so I really wanted to then take some of those conversations that I was having personally with people and share them with the world. And so I broke it down to these eight characters, you know, uh, uh, a police major who grew up in West Baltimore, who was having conversations with me where he said, he's one of the highest ranking African Americans uh, on the police force, but he was having conversation with me and he would say, you know, I know that none of my colleagues woke up that morning with homicide in their mind, but I also know for the kids in West Baltimore, why they don't believe me. You know, a, a woman who lost her brother to police violence just 18 months earlier in Baltimore City and who was loving the fact that Baltimore was rising up and Baltimore was, was, was marching and doing something about this, but also is feeling a real sense of frustration because she's basically saying to herself, but where was this when my brother was killed by police? And no one had anything to say. You know, a, a, a basketball star turned protester, the son of the owner of the Baltimore Orioles, who was the head of baseball operations. So when the Baltimore Orioles played the Chicago White Sox, and for the first time in baseball history, they played a game and the official attendance was zero because the city was in a state of emergency. He was one of the final people to make the call and say, I want to play the game even if there's no fans in there because I want the world to see this. And so by looking at it through these various sets of eyes, by looking at it through people who come up and represent different stratas of our society, you know, we really wanted to show a, a kaleidoscope of how complex so many of these situations are, but also how it still fundamentally comes down to two disparate issues. It's race and it's poverty, and how those two beasts have a way of coinciding to create pretty disastrous results if we're not dealing with them. So as you say at the end of your book, you know, we kind of know what the problems are. There's been a lot of studies. The question is, what do you do about it? And as we turn to that question, let's first of all talk about the respective roles of philanthropy and the government and basically public policy on the one hand or the other. And you obviously are involved in a philanthropy, a very important poverty-fighting organization. Talk about the Power Fund. 
Yeah. So we're really excited about the Power Fund. It's, it's, a, it's a new initiative that Robinhood is launching, and it's, it's, it's to fund and to elevate nonprofit leaders of color uh, who share Robinhood's mission and of, of increasing mobility from poverty. And, and this initiative really allows us to address poverty through the lens of this interplay that exists between racial injustice and economic injustice, where there is a complete overlap. Because if you look at the data around poverty and you look at the data uh, around, around race, you see that race uh, is, a, is a predominant and a leading factor in every single one of our data categories. So everything from life expectancy to health to, to, to wealth and income to maternal mortality, the role that race plays is undeniable. But also when you think about philanthropy, over the past two decades, only around 10% of all philanthropic dollars have gone to organizations that are led by people of color. So you see that, and, and also on the absolute basis of the capital, it's even less. And so philanthropy, our, our field, we fund fewer and we fund less when it comes to organizations that are led by people of color. So the Power Fund is really seeking to expand our, our funding to significantly increase leaders of color led organizations by providing self-directed leadership, capacity building, uh, funding, and, and supporting this field that we know is incredibly important if we're ever going to address this issue because the people who are closest to the challenges are oftentimes going to be the ones who are closest to the solutions. Uh, Wes, you mentioned earlier the lead poisoning that really contributed to Freddie Gray's tragic situation. Uh, you talk about, in your book, lead poisoning in general, but particularly poor and African-American children throughout the country. But you also have some numbers in there that are quite striking about fixing the problem and what it could really do for our society and, let's say it, our eco economy, our GDP. That's exactly right. I mean, when you, when you look at the impact of child poverty, uh, in this country right now. The impact of child poverty in this country is over a trillion dollars of economic impact. Every single year, over a trillion dollars of economic impact uh, is, is due to child poverty. And that's both uh, how we're going to deal with it later on, i.e. through the criminal justice system and educational enhancements and systems that are in place. But it's also in the, in the idea of how much it's going to cost and how much lost income we are then having when you then have people who are coming up out of poverty, you know, the probability of them staying in poverty is remarkably high because the economic mobility prospects in this country now, unlike what it was even just 40 and 50 years ago, is essentially a coin flip. It is now truly 50 percent. And you think about something like lead poisoning, where uh, and whether it is lead piping, lead paint. The challenge we have for that is we've known that lead is a neurotoxin in this country for over a century. For over a century, we've known the damages that lead does to, to, to the brain and to the body. Uh, we have just been incredibly class and color conscious in the way that we've decided to deal with it. You know, currently right now in Baltimore City, we have over 60% of, of, of the schools in Baltimore City that kids cannot drink the water from the water fountains because of lead. On something we have known is our neurotoxin. And so it's this type of thing that we as a large society have to have a very clear understanding and a very clear action plan about how are we going to address this. We literally could address this. We can make this country essentially lead free within a matter of three to five years if we just put, put forth the, the economic effort around it, which is not uh, in, in, in any way, in any way uh, you know, uh, monstrous or, 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 or disastrous, but something that's going to have a significant impact on the prospects of our children going forward. Yeah, it sure would fit with an infrastructure bill, wouldn't it? Wes, I really appreciate yeah, you being with us. And more than that, appreciate for this great new book that you read. That's Wes Moore. He is the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation and the, the co-author of the brand new book, Five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City. Great to have you with us, Wes. In the meantime, coming back here, we're going to be talking about politics. It looks like from the polls, President Trump may have an uphill climb. We're joined by Jeannie Zeno. She's our Bloomberg political contributor. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Coronavirus. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. 
Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. London. Toolstation are here to help get your job safely started and finished with over 60 branches within the M25. All open with social distancing and contactless click and collect from five minutes and with 20,000 top trade quality products to choose from. Order online now for collection in London branches and get £5 off when you spend over £30 with the code LON530. So, get your job started at toolstation.com. Terms and conditions apply. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Sponsored by SEI. Challenges highlight one's character, partnership, and resilience. At SEI, they act as one community with their clients. Go to SEIC.com slash banks. Stocks are trading mixed with gains in tech shares, blunting the weakness in airlines and hotels amid signs the world's economy still has a ways to go to ever get back on track. We check the numbers every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg Radio. S&P is down three-tenths of a percent, down at 11. The Dow is down nine-tenths of a percent, down 234. And the Nasdaq is up a tenth of a percent, up 12. The 10-year is up 6.30 seconds. The yield is 0.65 percent. West Texas Intermediate's up three-tenths of a percent at 40.72 per barrel. Comex Gold's up eight-tenths of a percent at 18.0810 per ounce. The dollar yen, 107.53. The euro is $1.1292. And the British pound, the dollar twenty-five sixty-five. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. Now more Balance of Power with David Weston right here on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the polls have been steadily moving away from President Trump, although we still have another four months or so to go to the election. And most recently, Citigroup came out with a survey of 140 top Wall Street fund managers. Really showed a shift, perhaps, on Wall Street, where back in December, 70% said President Trump would be reelected. Now, 62% say it will be President Biden come next January. Welcome now our Bloomberg political contributor, Jeannie Zeno. She's from Iona College where she teaches political science. Welcome back, Jeannie. Great to have you with, uh, with us. Take us uh, through the polls as you see them. Is it as bad for President Trump as it looks? Bearing in mind, we've still got four months to go. We still have four months to go. You know, nationally, we don't look at much of the national polls, but he's about nine to ten points behind Biden nationally. I think the real problem for him remains the battleground states. If you look at the top 14, he's only leading in three. That would be Georgia, Texas, and Florida, and they're only by, and Iowa as well, they're only by two to four points. So he's got a real challenge on his hands, and so he's going to be traveling later this week, we understand, to Florida. He's got to boost those numbers to New Hampshire. We just saw him out at Mount Rushmore and, of course, Oklahoma. But he's got to be very concerned about these battleground states. And the Citigroup poll you mentioned is very stunning because the very people who seven months ago felt pretty confident that the president would win, and and the numbers uh, historically would have bared that out, now are saying not only can Biden take this thing, but that they may see a Democratic Senate and a House as well. And that would be a really shocking turn of events because the, the Senate was really expected to remain Republican. And, of course, the policy impact on taxes alone for that kind of shift would be enormous. Yeah, and I want to talk about that issue with the down ballots. It's called particularly with the, with the Senate. Before that, let's talk about that trip that the president apparently is taking down on Friday to Florida. It's interesting. It appears that he's going down to meet with Central Command to talk about drug enforcement in Latin America. What does that tell us about the issues he wants to fight this campaign on? I guess law and order versus a pandemic that I think is consuming a lot of our attention right now, including in some of the states he needs. Absolutely. And of course, Florida is really feeling the impact of the pandemic right now. And yet the president is going to go down, as you mentioned, he's going to go to Southern Command for a briefing. It's right near his golf course in Doral. And I think it does indicate that he does want to shift the focus away from the pandemic, make the case that we are recovering, shift the focus away from there. We understand he wants to talk about drug trafficking, illegal drug trafficking. He also wants to talk a bit about immigration. And that trip to Florida may line up with some executive 
executive orders we see out of the White House on Friday in terms of immigration. So he really is trying to shift the focus, but it's going to be very tough in this environment. And of course, he is going right down to the hotbed of the pandemic right now, which is Florida and Miami, where we've just we're, we're hearing that they are going to be instituting all kinds of new rules and closing, you know, bars and other things down there because the numbers have just gotten so high. It's the hotbed of the pandemic. It's also the place that he's decided to move his uh, acceptance speech for the convention into Jacksonville. At the same time, we've got a lot of doctors saying you shouldn't come. We have Chuck Grassley, Republican senator, saying he's not going to go. Are they going to be able to go forward in Jacksonville? It's going to be. I can't imagine at this point how they can. I mean, they saw how this turned out in Oklahoma. That was not a good showing for them. They were, you know, forecasting a million. They got, you know, far, far less than that. It was an embarrassment for the campaign and the president. The Republicans don't want to repeat that for the convention, and I can't imagine they're able to do this in Florida in just a few weeks for a convention. So very tough to imagine how they do anything like that in person. Maybe they try to do something like they're doing in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on Saturday this week, where they're going to try to do something at an airport hangar outside, where presumably it's a bit safer and people can social distance and wear masks. But I think very tough to imagine how the Republicans pull this off in just a few weeks unless this thing turns around. Gene, you talk about the Senate. I mean, a year ago, I think most people thought there was no chance the Senate might switch Democrat. What are the chances now? The chances look shockingly good. I mean, if four to five months ago we had said that Democrats have a chance of taking this thing, it, it, it so un, was so unlikely. Republicans have 53 seats, Democrats 47, with two independents there who caucus with them. But there's at least eight Republican seats that the Democrats have a chance of flipping, and these are the seats in Colorado and Arizona, North Carolina, Maine in particular. And so if they can flip those and then take, you know, a few more of the others that are perhaps toss-ups, maybe a Georgia, maybe a Kansas or an Iowa, they could be in very good shape there. So it's something that really was unprecedented just a few months ago. And as we look at 2018, of course, a big problem for Republicans and what's scaring them so much is the, pre is the president weighing them down in the suburbs, especially with well-educated folks who seem to be turning away from him and potentially the Republican Party. They can potentially shift some of those states with that kind of playbook, similar to what Democrats were able to do in the House in 2018. And finally, Jeannie, thus far, the former Vice President Joe Biden seems to be making progress just by staying out of the way, frankly, of President Trump, if I could put it that way. But he can't stay out of the way when it comes to a vice presidential pick. Uh, are there risks there? Even as you look at that Citigroup survey, I mean, if Joe Biden was to pick somebody, for example, like a... I'm placing a new order to buy euro at 112.915. of a potentially Democratic House, Senate, and presidency is a fear that they are going to repeal, for instance, President Trump's tax bill that was, you know, so popular among certain sectors. If they are going to pull some of that back, as Joe Biden has promised, he's going to be, have to be very careful who he picks. And as you mentioned, the more progressive the person, the more dangerous that can be for Democrats in that regard. And that, I think, is partly why you see the president trying to keep talk about the dangers of progressivism in this country and what these, you know, left-wing Democrats mean for the country. He's talked about it a lot in terms of law and order at this point, but I think he would be far better off to talk about it in the context of policy, because that's where the real debate is going to ensue if Democrats take all of Washington next year. Yeah, no question, but I think there's going to be a lot of talk about socialism before we're done here, Jeannie. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's always <laughs> great to have you with us. That's Jeannie Zaney. She's Bloomberg political contributor and a professor of political science over at Iona College. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. New position open on euro United, against United States dollar at 112.915. Sue, or one of our other tech experts on Shop Live, Curry's PC World's online video call experience. Hi, it's Ali. What are you searching for? Isn't it nice to get expert advice from another human being before you buy? They're just a click away. Curry's PC World. Talk to our tech experts online with Shop Live. How do we control coronavirus now? Listen to Steph. She's a bus driver. Now that people are using public transport again, we really need to make sure that we keep each other safe. Passengers need to stay two metres apart. If that's not possible, make it at least one metre. 
I want to see everyone wearing face coverings over their mouth and nose unless you've got a good reason not to. And when you get to where you're going, you need to wash your hands. We've still got to play our part. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Trey Wingo here from ESPN's Golick and Wingo. Every morning, Mike Golick, Mike Golick Jr. and I sit down to discuss all the news, drama, and highlights spinning the sports world that day. And with TuneIn, you can hear us whenever and wherever you go. Just search Golick and Wingo and start listening today. Where do hockey and pop culture coexist? So let me get this straight. You would be able to name more people nostalgically than currently? This doesn't Come on. You're so crazy. I know, I know. Other <laughs> podcasts, Buck Zoop, <laughs> NHL analyst Greg Wyshynski, Sean McAdoo, and Ryan Lambert chase the conversational biscuit up and down the ice, skating between serious discussion on what's happening in pro hockey to irreverent opinions on movies, fast food, and life in general. Search Buck Soup on TuneIn to listen. Looking for your daily fix of NFL news and analysis? In that. So we had to blow it up with the Super Bowl predictions instead. Look no further than the Pick 6 Podcast, where CBS sports writer Will Brinson gets you up to speed with what's trending in the NFL that day so that you're always in the know. Yeah, it's pretty revealing of Brinson's methodology for predictions. When he gets mad at people for predicting good teams are going to win the Super Bowl or good players are going to win major awards, that's how you wind up. Search Pick 6 on TuneIn to listen. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. We have an eventful first week back after July 4 already, including President Trump planning to go down to Florida to talk about drug enforcement in Latin America. A lot going on in the markets, really paying attention to COVID virus. Right now, though, it's time for Bloomberg First Word News. Over that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you very much. In Florida, the percentage of COVID-19 tests coming back positive is climbing, undermining Governor Ron DeSantis' claim that the crisis isn't getting worse. The first time positive positivity rate climbed to 15.3% for Monday from 15% on Sunday. It's now at the highest on record, according to data compiled by Bloomberg, which goes back to early April. Florida has had more than 61,000 new cases over the past seven days, the highest ever. The Spanish government is extending some financial measures through September to help families weather the economic fallout from the pandemic. Utility companies cannot cut gas, electricity, or water supply, even if citizens fail to foot their bills until September 30th. Mortgage payments will remain frozen for those who can't afford to pay. A U.N. report published this week says the COVID-19 crisis has exposed, quote, serious weaknesses in Spain's efforts to reduce poverty. Tennessee Senator Lamar Alexander is the second Republican to announce he will skip the 2020 Republican convention. 86-year-old Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley said Monday he would skip the gathering out of concerns over the coronavirus. The convention is largely gathering in Jacksonville, Florida. Last week, Jacksonville had the fastest growing rate of coronavirus cases of any metropolitan area in the United States. Roger Stone is appealing to President Trump to grant him a pardon or commute his sentence before he begins a 40-month prison term next week. Stone, who was convicted of lying to Congress during the Russia probe, says his age and an underlying health condition made him particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. The U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington has ordered the government to respond by Thursday. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to continue Balance of Power on radio for a second hour. We've got a very special guest talking about the renaming of the Redskins, something President Trump doesn't like much. is Simon Moya Smith. He's an Oglala, Lakota Nation, and Chicano writer and activist. We're also going to talk with a prominent African-American executive from Silicon Valley about what it's going to take to get diversity into the C-suite in Silicon Valley. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Pursuits look at luxury. If these months of lockdown have you finally committing to check a safari off your bucket list, 
There's good news. Kenya has lowered its entry fees to game parks by 50% for a year. The goal, to revive Kenya's 1.44 million visitor strong tourism industry. Meanwhile, at home, Hamilton has proven to be a huge hit for Disney+. Plus. The recording of the five-year-old Broadway musical, which Disney paid $75 million for, was the most talked about new movie in the U.S. during the July 4th weekend. Typically, the market for film versions of live events has been pretty small, but with theaters closed and events all but called off, streaming can engage fans all over the world. Finally, Elon Musk made good on a promise to produce a pair of short shorts to mark his triumph over investors who had bet against Tesla. Musk unveiled the cherry red gold trimmed satin shorts on the electric car maker's online store for $69.420. Joan Doniger, Bloomberg Radio. The doors are opening. When is that moment out in the distant future? Some things will be as they were, others forever changed. The restaurant industry will never be the same. Follow every new development here on Bloomberg Radio. What do we need in terms of maybe the new school of economic thought? Because the next best thing to magic is insight. It may take nearly a decade for the U.S. economy to recover. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Adopt US Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo GOAT G-O-A-T Acronym Stands for Greatest of All Time As in Spaghetti Sandwiches for Dinner They're my fave Dad You're the GOAT You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same Visit AdoptUSKids.org Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Adopt US Kids and the Ad Council Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their businesses strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. Determination and operational strength are both essential factors for growth in asset management. I'm Steve Meyer, President and Head of SEI's Investment Manager Services Division. We know that disruptive forces create opportunities around the world. If you see potential and change, our industry specialists will maximize SEI's integrated platform of data and risk management, global investment operations, compliance support, and investor services to position your asset management business for success. Come grow with us. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at SEIC.com slash seize change. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take, this is Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellita. Mixed Tuesday, gains in technology shares, blunting weakness in airlines and hotels amid signs that the world economy has a long way to go to get back on track. The Dow lower, S&P lower as well, NASDAQ is higher. Two stocks are falling on the S&P for every one that gains, though the gauge is little changed as heavyweights such as Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook are all higher, sending NASDAQ to a record. Right now, we have got the NASDAQ Composite Index up 27 points, up three-tenths of one percent. The S&P 500 Index is down seven, a drop of two-tenths of one percent. Dow Industrials down 197, a drop there of about eight-tenths of one percent. Microsoft shares are up 1.1%, Apple up by 8 tenths of 1%, and Facebook up now by 2.2%. Again, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook all trading at a record. Tenure up 5.30 seconds with a yield of 0.65%, gold up 6 tenths of 1%, 17.95 the ounce, very close to 1,800. West Texas Intermediate Crude now higher up 3 tenths of 1%, 40.77 a barrel. So a mixed day for the equity market, but with more on commodities, here's Bloomberg's Renita. A Bloomberg survey shows U.S. gasoline stockpiles rose by 1 million barrels last week, while nationwide crude stockpiles are projected to have fallen. If confirmed by the EIA on Wednesday, it would be a second weekly decline. Rising coronavirus cases have forced major fuel-consuming states, including California, Florida, and Texas, to reimpose measures such as shutting bars and banning indoor dining, with lockdowns also re-emerging in 
and other corners of the globe. Meanwhile, BNP Paribas raised its oil forecasts and expects further recovery. Renita Young, Bloomberg Radio. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is meeting today with leaders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Anti-Defamation League, and Color of Change to address a range of concerns on Facebook. And San Francisco-based Gap, which introduced face masks to its stores and website earlier this year, is now selling them directly to employers. 102 on Wall Street. Time now for the Market Drivers Report with a focus on American depository receipts. And here is Dave Wilson. Thanks, Charlie. ADRs are falling more than U.S. shares. The S&P ADR index is down nine-tenths of a percent, and the S&P 500 is lower by two-tenths of a percent. Germany's buyer has lost 5% in U.S. trading. A U.S. district judge in San Francisco said he was tentatively inclined to reject an $11 billion settlement of claims that the weed killer Roundup causes cancer. Roundup is made by Buyer's Monsanto unit. China's semiconductor manufacturing international has fallen 8.8%. The chipmaker is moving to raise as much as $7.5 billion through what would be the mainland's largest share sale in a decade. Now, the ADRs have more than tripled this year. Uh, Japan's SoftBank Group has risen 4%. The shares underlying the investment company's ADRs climbed to a 20-year high in Tokyo trading. Founder Masayoshi Son has unveiled plans to sell assets and use the proceeds to cut debt and buy back shares. And Brazil's JBS has risen 2.9%. Credit Suisse said it expects the meat processor to deliver its best results ever for the second quarter. The firm raised earnings estimates through next year and reaffirmed the equivalent of a buy rating on the stock, Charlie. All right. We thank you very much, Dave Wilson, keeping track of those American depository receipts. Again, recapping here, it is a mixed Tuesday with the S&P, the Dow, both lower S&P down two-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ, though, at a record, up another 26 points, up three-tenths of one percent, bringing its year-to-date gain now to 16.6 percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Balance of Power. Everybody in the world has one common enemy, and that's to win the war against this virus. The first thing you do is listen to the medical professionals. Those people have lost their pay. We want to see that pay continued. Where the world of politics beats the world of business. Our priority is the health and well-being and the lives of the American people. We want to make sure that we are continuing to support our hospitals. We've unleashed our most potent weapon of all, the courage of the American people. Balance of power with David Weston on Bloomberg Radio. COVID-19 cases grow as experts debate why and how great the concern should be. The Supreme Court takes care of one election issue, but more are waiting in the wings as we head to November. And President Trump argues against sports teams changing their names in order to be called what he says is politically correct. From New York, welcome to the second hour of Bloomberg Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Pressure has mounted from fans and from sponsors for sports franchises like the Washington Redskins and the Cleveland Indians to change their names. But President Trump criticized the move on Twitter, saying the current names reflect what he called, quote, strength, and that the change would be only for the sake of political correctness. Welcome now, Simon Moya Smith, Oglala Lakota Nation and Chicano writer and activist. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Give us a sense. You wrote in the Washington Post powerfully about this. Why is this so important to Native Americans? Well, we think it's a step in the right direction. You know, I, Native Americans have been so canceled out of the American conversation for so long that people will continue to ask, you know, why is this an issue now? Why haven't you been saying anything? And they're like, we actually have, but for decades. Uh, the difference is now with social media and the Internet, people can hear our voice, see our faces, uh, hear our protests, essentially, in real time. So we have to remember that the term itself is a dictionary-defined racial slur. We're talking about the R word, the name of the Washington football team. But that doesn't let like the teams like the Chiefs or the Indians or the Blackhawks off the hook. That's still the dehumanization and commodification of a race of people. And this isn't just us, you know, you know, being, as one guy called, you guys are just party poopers. Why don't you just enjoy the game? No, hang on a minute. You have the American Psychological Association in 2005, 15 years ago, that called for the immediate abolishment of Native mascots because they have been empirically proven to harm the mental health and stability of kids. So this is an important move, but not just for justice and for, for indigenous people, but for the mental health and stability of our kids. 
See, yeah, that's a very important point you make that I had not picked up on, was not paying attention the way I should have been. And that is, it's not just a symbol, although symbols count. It actually has an effect, particularly on children and on their cognitive development as they grow up. I had not realized that, and there's uh, appears to be empirical evidence of that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's more empirical evidence coming out um, every year. And we have to remember also, we as fans of whatever team you're a fan of, you're going to cherish the name, the, the mascot, the logo, the players, etc. But mascots are also to be belittled. So imagine that the imagery is of an indigenous person. Well, maybe on your side of the field, you guys are celebrating it, not always in the best way, because painting your face red, just like painting your face black, is very, very racist. But on the other side of the field, they're mocking you. And they do that not just in professional sports, but also uh, in, in every in every state in this country. Where I'm at right now in Colorado, there's the Lamar Savages. And they say, well, no, that we're little savages. My grandpa's a savage. It's a family of savages. But you're, you're, excuse me, that, that's still racist. Your logo is an indigenous person. So I think now people are starting to introduce themselves to who Native Americans are today, but also learning like, wow, maybe that is really racist. It's, it's been kind of like part of our culture, but yeah, that is really wrong. Something that is obviously terribly important has been talked about a lot appears to be changing right now. Let's talk about something else that is terribly important. Is that is the differential effect of the coronavirus on Native Americans. We know about it with respect to African Americans. We know about it with respect to Hispanic Americans. But it also, as I understand, is happening with Native Americans. I'm not sure that's gotten the same attention. In fact, I'm not sure it even has the statistics reporting on it that we have for black Americans and for Hispanics. No, because, and that's another thing here, even in 2020, the diversity list that all news organizations and universities tend to use is still black, Latino, Asian, white, and other. And we're still in the other category at no fault of our own. We're the smallest racial minority in our ancestral land at no fault of our own. So those numbers typically aren't counted. And think of it this way, with what's going on with this pandemic, imagine you didn't have running water. Just imagine that, okay? And that's what a lot of indigenous families are having to deal with right now, especially on the Navajo Nation. So as bad as COVID is, I challenge anybody to try not to have running water or even have the ability to walk down the street and find somewhere with running water. Try it. Try, try to do that while there's a pandemic raging. So it's, it's, it's affecting indigenous people and our elders uh, in a way that it isn't affecting other communities. So we would hope people would understand why we are shutting down also entries to reservations. If you're going to, if you in, please don't come. If you're interested, we were going to have to wait for the pandemic to end because you can bring COVID with you. Uh, finally, let's talk about something that I think maybe maybe a happier note, which is the Dakota Access Pipeline. There was a ruling from the district judge now that stopped it. And in the Bloomberg report, they said it said it was a momentous issue for the Native Americans involved. Explain why that is so terribly important. Well, because it is an invasion of our lands. We have to remember that there was the Fort Laramie Treaty, which was, and if I can just make it really quick, a bunch of white people came over and said, look, we took all this stuff, we took all your land, we're gonna give you this parcel of land, this part right here, and we'll never, ever, ever, ever come in. We're not gonna come in, we'll leave you alone. I know we've done a lot of stuff, sorry about that, but this is yours now. Fast forward just, you know, 100 years. Well, of oil and gas. I mean, that's how they violated the treaty. They're like, yeah, we had that piece of paper, but you know what? Oil and gas, so we're going to do what we want to do. So I think it's really important that people understand that this is about the health and well-being of indigenous people. It's about the health and well-being of the two-legged and the four-legged and the birds. But we also draw on, on our sovereignty as indigenous people, right? As, as an Oglala Lakota, I am American, but I'm also a, a not an American. Um, and that's our unique relationship with the United States. Sorry, can you hear us? I'm sorry. I think I'm brocked out just at the very end there, but it was wonderful to have him with us as Oglala Lakota Nation and Chicano writer Simon Moya Smith. Really bring us perspective we don't hear nearly enough about. We have to do more work on that without a doubt. Coming up here with coronavirus cases rising, should we be less concerned because the death rate is not climbing? Max Neeson of Bloomberg Opinion has a column out just today, and he's weighing in on that subject saying, don't go too far too fast. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio. Reopening. 
requirements. Is there a likelihood that we have a sustained recovery? Requirements. Lawmakers have passed sweeping legislation. Returns. The president signed an executive order. Bloomberg Daybreak with Karen Moscow and Nathan Hager. We continue our Bloomberg radio team coverage. Everything you need now. Let's head to Washington now. Bloomberg Daybreak. Weekday mornings at 5 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Economics. All this doom and gloom is out there. Finance. Do you see this as a technical correction? Investment. What are you looking at to give you some sort of compass through this period? The Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Lots and lots of talk about what the Fed should and shouldn't do. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and the names that shape the world's markets. We speak with Professor Schiller of Yale University. Bloomberg Surveillance. Listen today at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. When you went car shopping, you meant business. You ace vehicle history searches and test drives. You out salesmen to the salesman. Now you've got your wheels. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you'll have the info you need to get more for your future. Go to aceyourretirement.org because when it comes to speeding past financial challenges, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad. When you buy tech online and you want to make sure you get exactly what you need, would you rather talk to a robot? Or to someone called Robert, or Jack, or Miguel, or Haley, or one of our other tech experts on Shop Live, Curry's PC World's online video call experience. Hi, I'm Ali. How can I help? Isn't it nice to get expert advice from another human being before you buy? They're just a click away. Curry's PC World. Talk to our tech experts online with Shop Live. When you're facing a problem, like how to make an electric car more efficient, you could sit down and talk it through. But at Honda, we decided to listen to the wind tunnel. With wing mirrors? No. Or without? Yes. With? No. Without? Yes. With? No. Without? Yes. Or with cameras instead of wing mirrors? Sweet. The new Honda E with wind cameras, not mirrors, because we listen to the wind. Honda, the power of dreams. If you have to drive, then it's more important than ever to watch your speed. As London starts to reopen, there are going to be more people on our streets. There'll be more people cycling, more people walking to work or to the shops. If you must drive, avoid the morning and evening peaks when the roads will be busier. We want the streets to be safe for everyone, all the time. So watch your speed. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Want to bet football can make you feel nostalgic? Playing days are over, so... On the podcast, NFL Alumni Lounge, Charlie Booth sits down with retired NFL legends to talk about their careers, life after football, and everything in between. This is Darren Waller. Good to have you. Yes, sir, it's good to be here. Dana White, welcome to the Alumni Lounge. Thanks for having me, brother. Big member of our NFL alumni family, the CEO of the XFL, Mr. Oliver Luck. Charlie, good to see you. Thanks for having me. We're here with the president, Mr. Eric Price. Good to see you. Search NFL Alumni Lounge on TuneIn to listen. This is Mike Golick from ESPN's Golick and Wingo. Every morning, Trey Wingo, my son, and I sit down to discuss all the news, drama, and highlights spinning the sports world that day. And with TuneIn, you can hear us whenever and wherever you go. Just search Golick and Wingo to start listening today. How do hockey fans know what day it is? Just turn on the Locked on NHL podcast, where a rotating cast of hockey experts guide you through the week with a different theme show for every day. From big news Monday to recap Friday. But we've got a couple of news items that are noteworthy in the NHL in the last week, one of which is below the NHL, and we'll bring that up first. So the AHL announced officially this has been speculated for weeks and weeks. But the AHL Search Locked on NHL on TuneIn to listen. 
You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. We're all guilty of spending too much time on social media. Why not add something genuinely useful to your feed with TuneIn? Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn about some of the best stuff happening around the app. You might just discover your next audio obsession. Ready for some straight talk on what's happening in the MLB? On the Barstool Sports Podcast starting nine, Dallas Braden and Jared Carabas cut through the BS to break down the league the way they really see it. Yeah, we're, uh, we're continuing our uh, little mini-series of college baseball coaches in addition to bringing you major league players from throughout the league. If you've been listening to Starting Nine for some time now, you know that we've had a big leaguer on every single episode for probably two years now. Search Starting Nine on TuneIn to listen. Four hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks are trading mixed. NASDAQ trading little change, but higher. Still at a record, up eight points for the NASDAQ Composite Index, up by one-tenth of one percent. The S&P is downtown, uh, down 10, a drop there of three-tenths of one percent. The Dow is down 210 points for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That is a drop of about eight-tenths of one percent. Stocks mix, gains in tech shares, blunting weakness in airlines and hotels. Amid signs that the world economy has a long way to go to get back on track among some of the airline names today. UAL again seeing lower demand. It is down 5.9%. American Airlines Group down 5.2%. Southwest down 2.9%. Delta down 3.8%. JetBlue shares, they are down by 3.2%. Ten years up 6.30 seconds with a yield of 0.65%. Gold up 6 tenths of 1%. 1796 the ounce West Texas intermediate crude up five tenths of one percent forty dollars eighty three cents a barrel. Recapping stocks mixed S and P lower by nine down three tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg opinion, informed perspectives, and expert data driven commentary on breaking news. It's time now for Bloomberg opinion, and today we welcome columnist Max Neeson. Max, you have a column on today addressing, I think, one of the big questions of the day, which is we know COVID 19 cases are going up across much of the country. Should we not be as concerned because the death rate seems not to be going up as fast as it did back in March, April? Yeah, so I, I think, well, I do believe that the death rate is likely to be a little bit lower and the lag, because this is very much a lagging indicator, is likely to be longer. Those deaths are absolutely going to catch up. Um, just in terms of timing, if you think about it, it takes, you know, weeks for, for someone to actually die of COVID, let alone for that to be reported. And, and the really big case counts um, we're really only starting, you know, more recently than, than people, I think, think. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is that it, it's, first of all, um, when you get enough cases, those things that might be causing the lower death rate, um, you know, less crowded hospitals, uh, knowing how to treat the disease better, better protection of the vulnerable, all of those start to break down when you start to have ICUs fill up and so many cases that it becomes, you know, truly difficult to, to protect those that you want to protect. So um, all points to even if we do have a lower death rate, um, we still need to treat the virus, you know, it's exactly the same threat uh, as it's been the whole time and then try to get those case rates down. Max, what about the age of the patients? Because it seems to be there's something of a shift down in age of the average median people getting this disease. Is it possible that might protect us from having those death rates really climb up? That, that definitely is, is likely to be a factor as well. And, and that, that does seem to follow from the data, uh, both because we're, we're testing more broadly, um, you know, not just people that are really symptomatic, um, and the fact that, you know, young people uh, maybe flock to, to the businesses that were reopening a little bit more. Um, and, and they do have better outcomes. But, but again, um, you know, that, that trajectory, that, that age shift, uh, may not last or may not be as protective uh, once you get to a certain point because 
Um, you know, there's only so much you can protect people, and there's broad community transmission. And, and there's the other thing to keep in mind, that, that death, uh, death isn't the only thing to be concerned about here. There's the, you know, the economic factor of, of having wide viral spread. People are scared to go out, and you have to halt reopenings or outright close businesses back down. And, and the long-term effects of the virus, something that, um, you know, there, there's reason to be quite concerned about, but we're only, uh, we still have a poor understanding of. So, um, again, you know, while, while any, you know, lower mortality, case fatality rate would, would certainly be good news, it's not guaranteed to last, and it's certainly not um, any reason to, to reopen or, you know, treat the virus anything less than very cautiously. And, of course, that is the critical question. How much do you reopen? I mean, uh, to be sure, any death, any serious disease is not to be taken lightly. So it's not like this is just fine. Don't pay attention to it. But there is a trade-off on the other side. What about the quality of treatment? Because doctors we talked to, I talked to the head of Cleveland Clinic yesterday, I talked to a Stanford medicine professor just today, said that we have improved the treatment. Uh, one thing, putting people onto their chests, right, is really helping a fair amount in the treatment. And also steroids and some cocktails and things. How much progress? have we made in the treatment? Uh, quite a lot, just because this was a, you know, a novel disease that, that presents very differently in, in different people. And, and that's something that it just takes time and experience and, you know, trying things out to, to, to figure out. So, you know, proning, that, that being one thing, uh, putting people on their chest, um, figuring out how best to ventilate people that require it and when, and, and very much, um, you know, steroids, the, the first um, you know, medical intervention to show an actual mortality benefit, and one that since that this story was published, that data was published out of the UK has become more common. So those are all things that, that will help going forward. And over time, um, you know, with with further studies reading out uh, development of of potential monoclonal antibodies and other promising treatment options, and you know, further information over time, hopefully that that trend will continue. Of course, in the long term, there's no solution other than a vaccine, I think, as a practical matter. And there seems to be some encouraging news on various fronts with going to stage three trials and broader trials and things. At the same time, Dr. Fauci got uh, all of our attention yesterday saying, well, wait a second, even if we get a vaccine, uh, it's not going to be like a measles vaccine where it just makes it go away. Uh, how uh, disturbing is that? Uh, how cautionary is that? Um, yeah, so th this is there's something very important that I think people who, who study vaccines have, have tried to make clear for some time, especially because we're, you know, moving really fast for a, a new disease, the likelihood of getting, you know, a full degree of protection, um, that, that might be too much to hope for. And that has serious implications for the public health effect of, virus, of a vaccine. You may get a vaccine that's only protective against a disease rather than infection or transmission, um, or only, you know, works better in, in younger or, or healthier people, but less well in older people. All of these things will basically mean that even when we do get a vaccine, we'll still, still need to have some level of, of distancing, of precaution, um, even though I, I think some people do uh, have it in their heads that, you know, binary, any vaccine means life returns to normal. It depends on what vaccine and, of course, how fast we can roll it out, both things that are still highly uncertain. Yeah, Max, quickly here at the end, how big of a problem is just the uncertainty? That is, we get conflicting information from government officials, things like that, about whether we should stay in, not stay in, things like that. That's a problem in itself. Absolutely. I, I think the, the lack of consistent messaging on, on everything from, you know, public health measures to vaccine timelines to vaccine efficacy is all, all difficult. Yeah, it's all difficult, that's for sure. Many thanks to Bloomberg Opinion columnist Max Neeson. You can read more on this and other stories from Bloomberg Opinion at Bloomberg.com slash opinion and on the terminal by typing in O-P-I-N-Go. Coming up here, the Supreme Court has dispatched the issue of the faithless elector from this year's election. But how many other contentious legal issues await? We're going to talk with Professor Richard Buffo of Columbia Law. And this is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. On Wall Street, U.S. stocks are mixed. The Dow is down 192 points, S&P down 7, but the Nasdaq is up 27 points. Tech heavyweights are leading the gains. The job market is full of surprises. The latest government report on May job openings shows an unexpected rise in the number of available positions. Hiring hit an all-time high as workers were called back. Separations fell. Retail at Gap, which has been fighting declining sales in recent years, has a new plan selling masks. 
It's selling them in bulk, 100,000 per, to businesses for their employees. And Facebook's chief operating officer says the company needs to get better at removing hateful speech. Sheryl Sandberg wrote in a post that being a platform where everyone can be heard doesn't mean it's acceptable for people to spread hate. Donna Wilson, Bloomberg Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived in Philadelphia. Local time is 3.05 p.m. and the temperature is 67 degrees. At this time, you are now free to use your cellular devices. You know that feeling when you get to turn your phone on after the plane lands? You can have that feeling every time you drive. Make sure your cell phone is stowed away whenever you are behind the wheel. Visit StopTextStopRex.org. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council. In-depth analysis, concise reporting, need-to-know global business news. Around the world and across the markets, Bloomberg connects the dots for decision makers. Stay on top of today's headlines. Follow big breakthroughs in tech. Understand the latest political issues. See how the world's wealthiest are spending their money. Track what's happening in the markets and much more. Subscribe today to Bloomberg, the global standard for business reporting. Get it all at Bloomberg.com slash subscribe. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Tuesday evening by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this rainy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. If you want to find out what the best laptop is for all those video conferences with your colleagues while sitting at your makeshift desk, you could ask a machine or someone called Mac or Luth or Ange or one of our other tech experts on Shop Live, Curry's PC World's online video call experience. Hi, it's Robin. Do you need some help finding the right tech? Isn't it nice to get advice from another human being? They're just a click away. Go online to Shop Live at Curry's PC World. False information about coronavirus is being spread everywhere. Popping up here, being shared there. Bing! Reaching and tricking more people with every share. They don't even understand the harm it can cause. False information can be hard to spot. Make sure you know what you're sharing. Don't feed the beast. Visit sharechecklist.gov.uk. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Honda. We're not a car company. We're more of a listening company. And now our ears have brought our attention to where people feel most comfortable. The lounge. So we asked ourselves, what could Honda do to innovate in this space? Well, how about more space? Calm and uncluttered with modern yet retro styling. And built-in screens compatible with your games console. It's the most comfortable lounge you've ever driven introducing the new honda e our small electric city car honda the power of dreams nothing phases the money campbell because his bills are under control with money supermarket even this the dentist not a flicker of anxiety fox is making love this laugh <laughs> He's calmer than a banana. So, be like the money calm bull. Get money calm. Money supermarket. Ready for some straight talk on what's happening in the MLB? On the Barstool Sports Podcast starting nine, Dallas Braden and Jared Carabas cut through the BS to break down the league the way they really see it. Yeah, we're, uh, we're continuing our uh, little mini-series of college baseball coaches in addition to bringing you major league players from throughout the league. If you've been listening to Starting Nine for some time now, you know that we've had a big leaguer on every single episode for probably two years now. Search Starting Nine on TuneIn to listen. Hi, this is Mike Tirico, introducing you to Sports Uncovered, the newest podcast series from the storytellers at NBC Sports that will shine a fresh light on the most unforgettable moments in sport. The reason why I'm smiling, I might get in trouble for this. Search Sports Uncovered to start listening today. 
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. Lots of power, the eradication of the faithless elector, explained by election law expert Professor Richard Befault of Columbia Law School. But first, let's get a market check with Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much, David Weston. Here's what's going on on this Tuesday, July 7th. Gold closing in on $1,800 the ounce. Right now it's $1,796. It is up 7 tenths of 1%. Most stocks are falling. Technology shares are gaining. The tech giants are outperforming. And NASDAQ is at a record. Right now, we have got the S&P 500 index down nine, retreating from yesterday's rally, down by about three tenths of one percent. The Dow is down 194 points, down seven tenths of one percent. But Nasdaq holding on to a 14 point gain. It is up by one tenth of one percent. The tenure up 7.30 seconds with a yield of 0.65 percent. Gold up uh, 11 dollars the ounce at 17.96. Again, that's a gain now of seven tenths. West Texas Intermediate crude up four tenths of one percent, 40.79 for a barrel of West Texas Intermediate Crew. Job openings edged higher in May as state and local authorities started to lift pandemic restrictions. And with more, here's Bloomberg's Vinny Del Judice. The government reports job openings rose to 5.4 million nationwide, led by accommodation and food services, retail and construction. Even so, the total is well below the start of the year when employers reported 7 million job openings. Job openings that involve workers recalled from furloughs aren't counted in the tally, a sign of potential strain. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is meeting today with leaders of the NAACP, the Anti-Defamation League, and Color of Change to address a range of concerns about Facebook. And movie theater operators, AMC Entertainment, Cinemark Holdings, and Regal Cinemas are suing New Jersey for keeping cinemas closed due to the risk of coronavirus spread while allowing stores, shopping malls, and churches to reopen. Recapping, equities are trading mixed S&P 500 index down eight, a drop of three-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Balance of Power continues. And once again, here's your host, David Weston. Thank you so much, Charlie Pellet. The Supreme Court yesterday resoundingly rejected the idea that members of the Electoral College had the constitutional right to vote however they wanted. To take us through the decision and its significance is Richard Berfault. He is professor at the Columbia Law School and a well-known foremost legal um, uh, scholar on election law, I must say. So, Richard, thanks for being with us. Give us a sense of this decision. And I guess, really, why did the court take this case? Sure. Um, so the case, as, as you mentioned, dealt, deals with the ability of the states to punish uh, so-called faithless electors, <clears throat> uh, uh, electors who are elected, uh, pledged to support a particular candidate, but then when they actually cast their votes vote for somebody else. Um, th that, it kept, that occurs very, very rarely, but in the 2016 election, there was a record number of electors who tried to be faithless, who tried to vote for somebody other than either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And as a result of that, it, two a number of states have laws that actually punish them, and, that, and in two of the states, Washington State and Colorado, those laws were used. And so the electors in both of those states were challenging the punishments that they got, I am the, the, the lower courts that heard these cases split. So in the Washington case, the Washington Supreme Court upheld the ability of Washington State to impose a fine on a faithless elector. But in the Colorado case, the federal appeals court said, uh, said that the Colorado law allowing Colorado to replace a faithless elector was unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court took those two cases to resolve this question of whether or not states can prevent or punish electors from being faithless. So there you have it, the classic uh, reason to grant cert, which is uh, a split between the circuits, so they sort of had to resolve the conflict. Is this really going to have much effect as a practical matter? As you say, it's been very rarely used, maybe more than ever in 2016, but it still wasn't material. Right. Now, candidly, I think it may be more symbolic than real. There have been very, very few faithless electors over time. Uh, it, it has never made a difference in a presidential election. But it did occur more than, than normal uh, in 2016, and maybe you could see it as a kind of a symbolic reaffirmation of the idea that whatever the original intention of the framers of having electors use their independent judgment, 
it really is, they really are there to translate the popular vote into electoral votes, but only the popular vote on a state-by-state basis. Um, and that's really what this is about. It, it's a recognition that um, political parties matter and that, that we are, to some extent, a democracy, but it's still a state-by-state democracy rather than a national one. So there won't be any litigation over faithless electors coming out of this coming election in November. But I wonder if we shouldn't anticipate at least the possibility of litigation over a lot of other issues, because it appears that we're going to have more absentee ballots used, more voting by mail. Already there's a lot of uh, dissension, I think it's fair to say, between the parties on how we can elect. It doesn't sound like we're going to have a, a result on election night, unlike other years, given where we're headed right now. That seems pretty pretty serious possibility. I mean, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of states are moving towards more vote by mail. Um, prior to this year, maybe about uh, 20% or so of voters voted by mail, but they tend to be concentrated in certain states. Uh, maybe another 10% or so voted early. You know, many states now have the ability for voters to go to a polling place. Uh, and ca- or some kind of central location in their county and vote a week within the week or 10 days before Election Day. There's going to be much more of that this year. In many states where, where there, was, there was no past practice, a very limited past practice of absentee voting, will be a ton more. And just there, absentee voting just creates a lot more technical issues for the election administrators. Uh, they're going to have to cope with that. Um, and yes, um, it means that in many places we may not know the results on election night because the absentee ballots, um, some states they require that they be in by election day, but then they only start counting afterwards. Some states say they can come in after election day as long as they're postmarked by election day. In those states, we may not see results for several days later, uh, final, if it's close, final results until could be a week after uh, election day. Well, President Trump has not been shy about saying that he thinks voting by mail is really a handmaiden to fraud, voter fraud, which raises the possibility even beyond having to count the votes, whether you could have challenges. I mean, some of us are old enough to remember those hanging chads down in South Florida back in 2000, and that that litigation went on for quite a while. Yeah, and I'm sure there will be challenges. There will be challenges before the election because... And many states don't have a, uh, make it easy to vote by mail, and I think there'll be a lot of lawsuits saying that they have to because of the health dangers uh, of voting in person. We'll know better about that as to see how serious this pandemic is come the fall. But uh, there's already been a lot of litigation uh, trying to force states to make it easier to vote by mail. Um, and then a number of states, the, the chief elections administrators, uh, have tried to make it easier to vote by mail, and sometimes that's been challenged by other groups saying they don't have the authority. So there's a there's already been a ton of litigation about that. And then, yes, going into the election, uh, there'll be a lot of claims. Um, you know, there are there, – this issue of fraud has been raised a lot. It is certainly a possibility, but there's very, very, very little evidence of it. There have been very, very, very few cases historically of any significant – of fraud and vote by mail. And, of course, it's kind of a funny point since I think the president usually votes by mail, as do a number of members of his cabinet. Um so it is, a, it is an allegation that's going to be raised over and over again. Certainly, I certainly can't say it'll, it never, it's never happened or it will, it will never happen, but it is very uncommon, very, very uncommon. And in many states, uh, pre, uh, pre, voting is predominantly by mail and has been so now for several elections. And correct me if I'm wrong, because you're an expert on this and I'm not, but, but typically in the United States, uh, election law has been a state matter, not a federal matter. There's a limit to how much the federal government gets involved. Now, in Bush versus Gore, you did have, as I recall, equal protection claim. Although right. the Supreme Court, when it ruled 5-4, to four, specifically said, don't cite this case again, which I thought was rather odd. Uh, but how much will this be federal? How much will it just be state court litigation? Well, it could be federal litigation, uh, but you're right. The, the background laws are almost entirely state law. Uh, Congress could choose to do more, but Congress has not. So, I mean, there will be federal equal protection claims that are being raised or federal due process claims. It does, there are, these are federal elections, and so there are federal issues presented. But the actual voting rules about uh, whether or not you qualify for an absentee ballot, what are the procedures 
for completing for getting and completing an absentee ballot or what are the rules governing early voting, uh, they will be those can be heard in federal court because they're likely to involve federal constitutional claims. Richard, in your travels through the election laws, have you gotten gotten any sense about whether the two main parties, Republican National Committee and Democrat National Committee, are already gearing up their litigation teams? Richard? Yes, uh, and that the litigation has already begun, uh, and that we've seen certainly uh, the run-up for uh, the availability of absentee votes has yeah. already begun. So, yes, I think we're going to see a lot of that. You're going to be a busy man, Richard Befault. Thank you so much for being with us. That's Professor Richard Befault of the Columbia Law School, as I say, really an expert on election law. And now I want to turn back to the virus. Uh, earlier today, Dr. Deborah Burks, who's the coordinator of the White House's Coronavirus Task Force, talked with our colleague Kevin Cirilli about the virus and specifically about what needs to be done to have a safe environment for going back to school. The current uptick in cases that now extends really from Washington State through Oregon into California, across um, Arizona, New Mexico, and then, of course, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Texas, um, is really a very critical outbreak that needs to be contained. And I think collectively, I was just out on, in the field going to um, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Florida, and really getting it on the ground, report and experience to understand how we can be even more supportive. I think we're supporting their testing and we're supporting increased human capacity at their hospitals. But I want to really applaud the governors who've taken decisive action to really mandate mandate increase social distancing, close bars, ensure that um, if you can't social distance in an indoor restaurant, really decreasing that capacity of indoor restaurants, moving dining outside, and really talking to the people in their metro areas and their counties and what each individual needs to do. We all need to do all of these things. But we also have to make sure that we're not bringing that virus into our households by having parties then inside the houses. So I think there's a lot we can do as individual Americans, but there's a lot we can do at the state and local and federal level to re support that response and change the course of this, really this pandemic across the South, but also now up the West Coast. And Dr. Burks, I mean, some of the numbers, it's astounding to see how young people, young people are, are really seeing a lot of the uptick in cases and they're making some poor decisions. They're going to bars, they're going to, you know, we all see the images on the news. How do we prevent young people from getting these infections? I think there's two pieces of that. One is to be very honest with them and to tell them that there's a spectrum of disease in young people. That truly, they will know people who are test positive that have no symptoms. They will know people with mild, like only a sore throat and a runny nose. They will know people who got a bad fever and were sick for two weeks. And they need to know that there's also young Americans who are in the hospitals right now suffering from very severe disease. And so there is a spectrum. I think when they saw that a lot of their friends had mild disease and then they saw in social media that people were having a great time together, you know, they wanted to have a great time together too. And it's now on all of us to really change those messages, to really resonate with our millennials and Gen Z's so that they understand the risk those decisions make, not only to them potentially getting infected, but their parents getting infected and, and critically their, their grandparents who may be in their 80s getting infected, all which we know have a very severe course. And so I think translating that message into something that people not only hear but act on is really critical. Sometimes in public health, we just keep saying the same thing over and over again and think that, you know, eventually it will resonate. No, people turn off. So we really have to make messages much more tailored to very specific age groups so that they not only can hear the message, but internalize it and then change their behavior to really protect themselves, their, their friends who may have pre-existing conditions, and protecting others by really being in masks all the time. We can get through this um, until we have a vaccine if we all do our part. A lot of parents have children who are go 